Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Town of Thompson Station Board of Mayor and Alderman meeting for the month of April 10th, or for the month of April, uh, April 10th, 2018. I'm going to go ahead and call our meeting to order. Our first uh, order of business is a Pledge of Allegiance. All those would rise. All right, the uh, board has before it the minutes from our March 13th, 2018 meeting. I'll entertain a motion. Uh, I, I have one requested edit before we make a motion. Um, on the first page where it says, after discussion, Alderman Bell made a motion. Um, vote was three to two with Alderman Dilks and Shepard casting dissenting votes due to lack of detail. Uh, I'd like to revise lack of detail to a motion not including proposed revisions by Alderman Shepard. That was the reason for my dissent. All right. I'll entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve the minutes from March 13, 2018. Along with additional comments from Alderman Dilks. All right, have a motion. Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. All right, uh, we have public comments. A couple of folks have uh, signed in to speak during public comments. We'll welcome anyone who wishes to speak during public comments, uh, even if you haven't signed in. Uh, Mr. Gillum, I know you asked to speak probably on one of the issues that comes up under the public hearing, for that matter. Um, uh, so you can speak at public comment or at the public hearing, uh, which is agenda item number three. Why don't you wait until agenda item number three, if you would, public hearing. Is that okay? Okay, fantastic. All right, um, so we'll move on to Mr. Bob Brinson. If you please come forward, state your name and address. He's actually submitted a video public comment. Oh, this is, this is a new. Uh, uh, all right, well, I'll ask the board, do we allow video public comments? If you can't make the meeting, do we, do we introduce videos into the, into, the, into the public comment section? This is first. Uh, well, before I do, I just I'd, I'd want a motion and approval to continue because otherwise, all our citizens can mail in their videos or, or have their letters read, and I don't think that's the purpose of public comments. Indeed, I think the last thirty minutes have been about getting to know your neighbors and and uh, making new friends. Uh, that's why we come together. So, I would think that whatever he has to say, he could say that next month. Or Person, I, I, you know, I, I do understand the concern of you know, just now receiving videos and and there not being you know opportunity to really understand exactly what the issue is at hand and having the dialogue if necessary after the meeting. Um, I would be of a mind to ask Mr. Brinson to come back and uh, speak to us in person. I think I think he did submit written comments as well. He, did he? I Re think so. Okay, I, so. I mean, I just see I see Boma's script on the. On the submittal, so if there was something written like it could have been emailed to the mm -hmm. you know the board before the meeting. That would be fine. Uh, well, he was particularly concerned about a discussion tonight about the uh, the pledge not to build a, a sewer plant on the Alexander property, and he couldn't be here because of a work commitment. Um, but he wanted to get his comments on the record. Well, there's, I I I'd like to see him in person, personally. Okay, well, and there's I, no discussion of a sewer plant on the Alexander property. Let's be clear about that. Make a motion to hear Bob Branson's comments. Motion. Second. Motion second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Three to two, it fails. Let's move on. All right. Um, let's go to, um, okay. Before we close public comments, it's still open. Anyone wishing to speak, please come forward. 
Yes, sir. Mr. Simmons, if you'll just state your name and address. I'm Larry Simmons, 3116 Hazleton. And I uh, just want to give a follow-up on the meeting we had on uh, March 20th here from the uh, Tollgate uh, meeting we had talking about the development of the front of Tollgate. Uh, you will recall that we had a vote back in December that was 100% voted in favor of the development in front of Tollgate. We, uh, there were some questions, was uh, did we really understand what we voted for? So we actually did another vote, which each of you received the, the, the poll as, to, as people voted. And it was uh, 241 yes votes, 12 no votes. So basically 95% of the people voted for development of the front of Tollgate as presented tonight. Uh, on March 20th, we had another town meeting. Uh, if you recall, that meeting was a horrible weather. It was snowing, sleeting. Uh, there was a crash on the interstate, and traffic was all being diverted down uh, the highway out here. So we didn't have quite as many people as we had hoped would show up. But once again, 81% of the people voted in favor of development for, for the front of Tollgate. So I, uh, I just come tonight representing the, the residents of Tollgate who overwhelmingly have, have said we want the development in front. We understand there's questions about, you know, are we losing revenue for the town as far as uh, tax revenue? We understand there's questions about can we hold out and do better? Uh, we understand those questions, but we also understand that we have a very reputable builder that wants to build in the front of Tollgate and get something started and have some revenue coming into to, to, to Thompson Station. So uh, I just wanted, again, thank you for being at the meeting. And I ask tonight, you, you've heard the vote three times. I ask tonight that you vote in favor of this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. All right. Anyone else? Going once. Twice. All right. We'll close the public comments. We'll move on into the appointment discussion around the Board of Zoning and Appeals and our Design Review Commission. We have some, some open seats or some terms that have expired, so the purpose of our discussion is to fill the spots and I believe to discuss whether or not we change the staggering of yes, the Yes, we've got to pay attention to the staggering of the terms so that we can, you know, uh, again, BZA is supposed to have one, uh, one term expiring every year rather than, you know, three and potentially four like we have this time. The right. DRC, I think, is a, a two, two, and one. So again, that's how those terms should be staggered. All right. So uh, we'll start with uh, BZA then. So again, I think we've had uh, at least uh, three people express interest in in the uh, Board of Zoning Appeals: Mary Heron, uh, Justin Wilson, and uh, Miriam Wiggins. Uh, again, however, we want to put. Oh, and Mac Hughes. I'm sorry. Sorry, Mac. Um, so yeah, we can fill all of the the, uh, the open seats that are currently on the Board of Zoning Appeals with those four uh, with those four applicants. It's just a matter of deciding what terms you want to assign each one. And again, there's no real rhyme or reason as to who gets what term unless anybody has a strong feeling about one or another. We did discuss at the last meeting, uh, I know Jeff Risden uh, is the only current serving board member about potentially expanding or extending his term to the, the longest one or 2021, whatever it was. Um, so again, as part of your appointment, you can make the uh, make the adjustment to uh, to Jeff's term if, if you still wish to do that. So yeah. the the applicants are different than, than what's listed in our report. What are they named again? I'm sorry, the one that are listed listed in the report are the expiring members. Okay. Those are the current members of the. All right, board and then we members. have uh, Mary Herring. Mary Herring's resume here. Then we have Justin, Justin Wilson. Wilson. We have Charles Stark. And then well. I'm sorry, Charles Stark was for DRC. So right okay. now we're just talking about Charles Board of Zoning Appeals. DRC. So again, the four I have are Mary Herring, uh, Justin Wilson, Miriam Wiggins, and Mac Hughes for um, Board of Zoning Appeals. Steve Bennett was? Design yeah, Review. So we'll, we'll do that next. And all the current... BZA members are, they want to continue, are there any who do not want to continue? Um, well, again, we reached out asking for interested people to come tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so again, uh, Archie decided not to attend uh, and Martha, that was the only other one. 
Timothy Miller had resigned because uh, I think he knew mm -hmm. that attempt. So as far as you know, Archie and Martha do not want to serve anymore? That's, that's my understanding. Okay. And again, Mary is uh, one of the people on the list is asking for reappointment. She's here. I met her. She is, yeah. Does the board elect their own chair, or do we appoint the chair? They elect the chair out of the, the group. I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve Miriam Wiggins, term expiring 2018, Mike Hughes for 2019, Justin Wilson, 2020. Miriam Wiggins, or I'm sorry, Mary Herring for 21, Jeff Riston for 22. All right, I have a motion. I'll second the motion. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion, questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. All right. So does that fill all the seats? No. Yes. EZA? Yes. We're Five done. members. That's, that's exactly right. Okay. All right. DRC. Uh, Design Review Committee, again, there were three that were up for uh, uh, or expiring terms, and uh, uh, Steve Bennett was the only one that applied for a reappointment. Um, then we also have two others that are interested, uh, Mr. Charles Stark and uh, Sarah Alexander. So again, because of the, the staggering of terms, uh, two of them would have to be appointed to terms ending in 2019, and one of them would have to be uh, 2020. Okay, so if I got this right, all three, there's three members on DRC total? There's, there's five total. There's five total. We have three that are expired. Correct. One of which is fine continuing to serve. With Mr. Bennett. So yes. nominated. Okay. And then we have two. Two new applicants. Two applicants. Right. Okay. So am I doing the math right? So. That'd be a, fi a total of that'd five. That'd be five. Yep. Okay. And that's a full, that's a that's full, full board full as well. DRC. Okay. All right. I'm going to entertain a motion. Motion to approve Charles Stark, uh, expiring term 2019, Sarah Alexander, expiring 2019, and Steve Bennett, expiring 2020. Have a motion. Second. A motion and a second. Questions? Comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. All right. Mr. Stark, go get your wife. <laughs> thank you, uh, new members of the BZA, and thank you. Steve Bennett for serving in DRC, Mary for your service, and excited to have you all continuing and the new folks getting up to speed and your willingness to help the town out. So congratulations and stay tuned. All right, let's move into unfinished business. Uh, agenda item one under unfinished business, public hearing and second reading ordinance 2018-007, an ordinance of the Board of Mayor and Aldermen of the Town of Thompson Station, Tennessee, to amend the land development ordinance to incorporate a definition and golf course standards into the land development ordinance can be found in file LDO admin 2018-002. Okay, this is second reading. Can you hear me? It doesn't sound like it's working. This is second reading for ordinance 2018-007. Uh, during the first reading, the board had asked staff to take a look at uh, the provision for gar carts, paths to be provided to each hole on the course, and also to consider lighting. Um, in doing a little bit of research on lighting, uh, there's not a lot of codes that actually regulate the lighting that I was able to find for golf courses. Um, so we are, we're recommending that no lighting be permitted, um, given its proximity to residential units, uh, it would avoid that struggle between the light trespass and future residences. So we've added cart paths shall be provided to each hole on the course as number six and no lighting shall be permitted for the golf course as number seven. With those, those are the only two amendments that were made. Um, and I did clarify under number three that it's buffer type three, which is a semi-opaque screen. Um, with that, staff's recommending that you open the public hearing and um, adopt the ordinance. All right, thank you, Wendy. All right, I'll go ahead and open the uh, public hearing uh, for the second reading of Ordinance 2018-007. Anyone wishing to speak, please come forward. All right, 
There being no one wishing to speak, we'll close the public hearing and it's back to the board for discussion and a motion. You did look at other towns, zoning ordinance, golf courses. Apparently. I did, but a lot of them don't even have, a lot of the ones I looked into didn't even have standards at all for golf courses. I think the only thing I was a little nervous about was driving range, you know, fencing height. I don't know if we looked at just, you know, many driving ranges have high, very tall, you know, 40, 50 foot fences around them. I, I don't know if that'd be appropriate in some, some environments in, in our town. So I don't, I don't know if we have restrictions on the heights of such structures around a driving range. <clears throat> we, we have a maximum fence height in our code of six feet. So I don't you feel like that covers us. I I do. I think okay. that would cover us. Okay. Um, buffer type three semi opaque screen. Is that landscaping, trees, vegetation? Both. What so about okay, go it, ahead. it could be shrubs and trees of varying heights just to create that screen. We actually have right. an illustration in the code along with some text that defines it pretty well. Okay, and netting, a lot of these driving ranges have netting and so forth. Is that, does that need explicit consideration or is that just from a safety standpoint and, or anything else? Is it? That's not addressed with these standards. So if we wanted to address it, we would need to build something in this evening. Yeah, I don't see a reason to hold up approving something like that. I was just curious more than anything. If, if it, I'd certainly want to be in, have the right safety aspects. Covered. We can always come back and add that if we want. We can make a motion to include netting. I don't know. I don't know how specific you would have to get for something like that. I was just quickly trying to read to see if there was anything that would cover us, like a distance between right. residential structures. Um, I, I think that that obviously covers non-residential <coughs> structures, but. Netting wouldn't be considered a structure because it doesn't really have the framework. Um, I think that we could explore looking at another standard to deal with the netting, but I would, I really couldn't suggest anything here this evening. I will say that in all the codes that I read for golf courses, <laughs> nothing on netting caught my attention or fencing either. So I didn't find a lot of standards. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? I'll entertain a motion. A motion to approve second reading ordinance 2018-007, an ordinance of the board, mayor and alderman of the town of Thompson <coughs> Station, Tennessee, to amend the LDO <coughs> to incorporate a definition of golf course standards into the land development ordinance. All right. LDO amend 2018-32. Great. Thank you. I have a motion. Second. Second. Have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. All right. I, item number two under unfinished business. Public hearing and second reading of ordinance 2018-008. An ordinance of the Board of Mayor and Aldermen of the Town of Thompson Station, Tennessee, to amend section 3.3.7, known as the Hillside and Steep Slope Standards within the Land Development Ordinance be found in file LDO admin 2018-003. Okay, this was initiated um, on February 12th when a local builder had come forward to the Planning Commission during one of their work sessions to discuss concerns related to the height restrictions for anything that's in our Ridgeline Protection Area. On Feb February 27th, the Planning Commission took this under consideration and made a recommendation to eliminate the requirement for one story and to increase the height of the structure to 32 feet. On March 13th, the board reviewed it at first reading and requested that staff take a look at how height is measured and referred that back to the Planning Commission for a recommendation. On March 27th, the Planning Commission considered a recommendation from staff for measurement from the lowest grade to the highest peak of the roof. Um, after consideration, the Planning Commission did recommend for that standard, it was a four to three 
vote that evening. Um, and so we are here this evening with that one amendment made to include where it says 32 feet measured from the lowest point of grade to the highest point of the roof. Um, with that amendment to this amendment, staff is recommending that you open the public hearing. Mr. Raines is here to speak um, during the public hearing on, on behalf of himself regarding this standard as well. Okay, all right, thank you, Wendy. We'll go ahead and open the uh, public hearing at, at second, on the second reading of Ordinance 2018-008. Uh, anyone wishing to speak, please come forward. Side. Mr. Board and staff, thank you for again for allowing me to discuss this ordinance change before us tonight. Let me first start off by saying I've owned this plan for two and a half years and have divided it into two tracks, and the third was already recorded when I acquired the property. Our family bought the property with intentions of building our home with a view and a walkout basement. Um, so uh, we, we come to find out last October this ordinance was changed and which adversely affects my family and financial situation. We've drawn two home plans now and had paid more than what we planned in entrance, which is irrelevant to the situation, but some hardship there. Uh, not to mention the hardship is created by losing a contract for two of the tracks by the same family and loss of income from what was to be built. All the while as the landowner was never notified by me, other than maybe in the agenda minutes. Um, now fast forward, um, fast forward to what's here tonight before us. The Planning Commission has sent back for a second reading and approval to amend this ordinance in which I'm very appreciative of this discussion. The ordinance reads, and not verbatim, but uh, that a home over 900 feet of, above sea level shall be no higher than 25 foot excluding basements. Most, in my entire acreage, is above the 900 foot mark. Um, and we've, uh, we, the Bowman and Planning Commission discussed, it sits well, uh, well off, it's on an easement, sits well off, over a thousand feet off the road, which is Evergreen Road. Um, and you can't even see, it's not visible. Many of the three home sites are not even visible from Evergreen Road. Um, so if the new language was adopted by allowing the 32 foot measure from the lowest point, then that is good for a crawl space home, but in most basement homes, uh, will severely harm the homes with an elevation change. For example, of seven feet, um, it really reduces quite a bit of what you're allowed to do. And in my personal home situation, my lot across the building pad falls 13 and a half feet, uh, meaning I will only be allowed to have roughly a 17 foot height from the finished first floor. This math is simple, yet it makes my land extremely challenging uh, to find the acceptable and practical building site. Mind you, I've owned this again for two and a half years well prior to this ordinance change. Is my understanding, and I'm gonna defer to you to this, Mr. Moore, uh, it's my understanding that this board has the authority to modify and pass the proposed ordinance by the Planning Commission set forth. I'm asking as a landowner and from the sincerity of my heart and my family's heart that this be changed to the, to the one of the following. And again, let me say that I've owned this for two and a half years. Um, I'd like to see approved the 32 foot from the front elevation. This is how most homes are viewed as you approach through whichever way you approach it, through an easement, through a road. Um, at all, or, or a 32 foot and excluding basements. So when we, when we, when we now have, um, I guess, raised it 32 foot but excluded basements, mine's almost unbuildable. So finally, I appreciate everyone's time and consideration. I totally understand the original intent of the ordinance, but I feel like it was done in a non fully vetted way. I've been and, and I am fully worried about this situation that's come up and what potential hardship this has created unknowingly. After two and a half years of ownership, I hope others behind this as well will be protected in a more secure way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raines. All right. Um, anyone else wishing to speak? All right. If there's no one else wishing to speak, we'll close the public hearing for this uh, second reading of Ordinance 2018-008. Um, all right. Uh, I, you and I have spoken on the phone, and I, I certainly empathize with where you're at, and I think we have had really good intentions with our LDO, and it continues to be a work in progress that we're trying to refine. I think the overall intent was to, to keep these hillsides somewhat unencumbered for big, ostentatious structures and to preserve, preserve the viewscapes and the, the buffering so everybody can enjoy it and so forth. So sometimes you get into some of these unintended consequences kind of discussions, and so... Uh, I understand where you're at, and I know, Ben, you've been in these discussions, planning commission, 
Brandon, you're an architect. I, I'm open to yeah. leadership here. I guess, I don't know, maybe Ben and Wendy, can you give us a little more insight on kind of some of the discussions that occurred at Planning Commission? And Yeah, really the, the only debate was uh, was measuring that, uh, the, where, where the starting point for the height would be, would be measured from. Um, Planning Commission recommended an average grade. Um, I actually disagreed with that recommendation. Um, the reason I disagree is because I think it actually encourages development on top of the hill because in order to maximize that 32 feet, if you build on top of the hill versus down the slope a little bit, you can get 32 feet from above grade because you're on the very top of that hill. But if, you're, if your foundation is sloped a little bit and you use average grade, you aren't, you aren't allowed to build your, your building as high, but you're also you know, unable to uh, to maximize your, your living space. So the the motion was, you said you didn't agree with average grade plan. That I, I didn't agree with average grade because I think it unintentionally encourages development on the hill higher on the hill okay. versus down the grade a little bit. But was the motion that passed? Did it was it based on an average grade plan definition? It was actually lowest point. Oh, was it lowest point? Yeah. Sorry, okay. Okay. there was okay. discussion of and average that, at lowest. Yes, there was. Right, and and that was what the disagreement with I think speaking for two others, but they felt that that would cause the house to be pushed higher up. Um, and they were wanting to be a little bit more flexible with how they measured the height. The lowest point, uh, the lowest point of would, would push it higher, would push a house higher. And I would think, in my opinion, not an average grade plane. Average grade plane, you would want it more in slope of a hill to get a higher house. Um, now versus, say, the front elevation measurement. That's, yeah, that was the one, that's kind of why, why the reason I brought it up, because it was, it can sometimes be hard to define what the front of a house is, you know. So that's why I th thought it'd be fair to say average grade plane, so it, you calculate all four sides of the home, and then that establishes the benchmark to measure right. the height. Right. But even that encourages, that pushes your house further up the hill. And I think it depends on the slope of the site, though. I mean, if it's, if it's flat, I mean, it, it, uh, hills, they crest, right? So they're flatter up top. Right. So your average grade plane is going to be lower. Well, right. If, if you're on the hilltop, your average is going to be. It's measured like one, six one. feet off of the perimeter of the building. So it's going to be. If you think of the way a hill crests, the hills yeah. is flat at the top, right? Just like right, a couple right, of right. So, so, you, so you could build 32 feet from that average on the hilltop. But if you are down the hill a little bit, your average grade, there could be a. 10 foot difference between your highest point and lowest point or something yeah, like that. I, I, you take your average grade, I, I see you're saying. you don't get to build as high, and yeah, but it's, yeah, you're I see penalized you're for building further right. down the slope. Well, yeah, it depends on, yeah, okay, I understand what you're saying. Um, I, so, where do we get the 32 foot number? Did you, did Jake, did you propose that originally? You did. Uh, I've come up with something, you're an architect, you know more than I do probably about this, but. Uh, Plenty of good store and a half looks well, well within the a 32 foot ridge line, top ridge line that we can accomplish. Um, I mean, we're not looking for two story massings, but somebody else could. So I understand that you got to protect that, but we certainly can get second floor living space easily in 32 feet. Now, if we start falling like most on my property, I'm in trouble pretty quickly. There's not any flat ground whatsoever on the whole entire 28 acres. I've got, there's issues everywhere. And so I had this well before that. That's my, that's my whole beef, I guess. But What language would you be preferring, what, what language you, would you prefer to have that, that both is the height and where the base point of the measurement is? Well, I, I asked Wendy, but I, I, I get to, I, I like finished floor elevation because everybody can, speak, it's pretty easy to establish mm. on, a, on a site plan. Um, so I was, I was proposing I would like to see it from the finished floor elevation. Um, now that's going to cost a few feet, probably because you're losing the, the foundation. Um, but you know, really, too, the crawl space homes could probably could probably work out on that number. It's just it, the basements really get get hammered on these slopes. I mean, because you can't. Get, we're just we're just. I mean, like I said, my lot falls 13 foot, 13 and a half feet across. I can't I can't get what above, above that on the first floor. I can't get to my roof that I need to get.
I mean, I'm locked. I mean, I've got, there's, you know, I can't spend the money to go to the BZA to try to get and risk that getting shut down or getting stopped either. Get plans and site plans and grading plans drawn out and the BZA kicks it out and then I'm, then I'm out you know, tens of thousands of dollars at that point. Well, the, I think the, the intention here is not to, we're trying to prevent tall structures, as the mayor said, and, you know, 32 feet, 35 feet, you know, what what is the magic number? It's without seeing a, a site-specific section that shows, you know, your, your building section, your house section through the site with the, you know, existing grades and proposed grades, it's really kind of hard for us to understand. Um, I don't, I, I think the, the spirit of this code is to, to not prevent you from building a single family residence on the property. It's just preventing you from building a, you know, a two, you know, taller than a two or three story building, right? Basements, walk up basements, I think make total sense on, on, a, on a site with slope. So they shouldn't be, they shouldn't hinder you, in my opinion. Um, so, you know, if you say finished floor, finished floor to me can mean the finished floor of the walk up basement or the finished floor of the main residential floor, which is your second story, theoretically. So there's a little bit of, We'll go right in there. I, I don't know where I'm going with this. This is a challenge. Um, I just asked Ben. The yeah. code is 25 feet. Is it right? We were going to increase right. to 30. Right. To 32. Yeah. Do we have to change the ordinance, or is this? A, could we make an exception for a one one-off lot? Is this? A, no. Again, it's the since the ordinance says 25 feet right now, that is the maximum height. So again, how we measure the grade is, I guess, is something that is still negotiable. And uh, again, the whole purpose of this amendment started with increasing that height from 25 to 32. But then what threw me was excluding, you know, originally 25 foot excluded basements. And now the 32 foot is on any structure. So that's actually gone backwards on the basements. Or why the basement is excluded. It, it, used, it used to say 25 feet uh, one story excluding the basement. So the basement would not be counted toward height. But when they <coughs> eliminated the one story, they also eliminated the basement because that was basing it on a different different category for height. They were recommending to base it on a number of feet. Um, one of the, uh, Mr. Raines has mentioned to me on several occasions about finished floor. And the concern that I have with that is finished floor comes in on a set of building plans and while Mr. Raines, I'm sure, would have his finished floor accurate, a lot of times those finished floors end up not being the accurate, uh, as accurate as the approved site plan. So that, that becomes my concern with having people put a finished floor on there. Um, I think what Mr. Raines had mentioned at one point is when he's discussing the front of the house as being that measuring point, he's looking for the highest grade, the point of highest grade, to the highest point of the roof. Is that accurate? Yeah, I'm thinking aesthetically. I mean, when you, as you approach, or what you're going to view is the front of the home. Any way you come into the into the property, and I would like to see it measured from from the front of the home. I mean, that's. I mean, that's what you try to. That's what you try to accomplish in any development or any neighborhood that you build in is the front elevation, which you, it's what everybody sees. Um, Oh, you threw out 35 feet. I also throw out like, why is it 900? You know, kind of because like Forest Hills is 800, but there's yeah. ways, there's other ways, but they allow you to go a lot higher. But so, I mean, I get yeah, just like the number, but um, I don't know, it's it's tough. I mean, same thing. This client wants a a barn and they're this, they want a barn and a hay barn, and you know, those are hard. There's a lot of well over 32 foot, and they're they're cramped to that too, which they can make it work, but. It's primarily it's primarily this this basement. The topography of the ground is not going to cut it any way or the other. I just, you guys are more welcome to come out there. I can send you topography maps, which I'm sure you have at your disposal. But I mean, I'm crushed on it. I mean, there's no other way to skin it. Did you um, do you have a did you have a building section drawn like a house section? I had some that we prepared just a very basic. You know, two-dimensional right um, yeah. houses we build all over the place that are under the 32 foot and under. It shows the roof line and then yep. The, yep. the grades that, as you understand them, around the property. Correct. And if if 
the if the dimension was taken to the lowest point on the front of the house, what height would you need to achieve that structure you're trying to construct? Um, I saw 13 feet, and I could get a home in 32, so I'm probably you're looking at 42 to 45 feet on the back side. But still on the front, I would probably be at 30 or 31. Because the fall, the lay of the lot, it slopes, I mean, it's at a 15% you know, slope. So it's a story and a half, though? It's a two-story building? Yeah. And the, from, the, from the high side, it's 45, 42? No, from the high side, I'd be, at, I'd, be under, I'd be at 30 or 32 feet. But at, to the low side, like they're talking about measuring, it would be you know, 42, 45 feet, which would be, never be visible until you get to the rear of the home. Correct. You still achieve the front look by... I mean, it's a store and look, the roof comes down to the front eave and you got, I mean, you get it, dormers or shed dormer or some form of dormer or a gable, it's easily accomplished at the 32 foot mark, but not when you, not when I go to exclude the basement, the lot falls at 13 feet. I don't, you know, I, I, I'm leaning towards average grade plan definition and, and the height and 32, I, I mean, we can negotiate that. I, I mean, planning commission felt that was appropriate you know, I, is there anything, any more, y'all, anything to add to this? I think average is the fairest because every, every hilltop is different. <coughs> I mean, from a slope standpoint. I, I still disagree with that because of the unintended consequence. It's going to force Mr. Raines, basically, or encourage Mr. Raines to, if he wants to, to build a story and a half house, to build it on the top of the hill and forego the basement. Mayor, yes. I mean, one suggestion that I might have, if, if you measure it from the highest point on within the building envelope, regardless of what foot limit you set on it, that would seem to me to accomplish the purpose of the ordinance, which is to reduce it from being higher up and would also encourage construction off the hilltop because they would be limited by that top elevation. Measure top down versus bottom up. And I, my concern with the average would be just difficulty in calculating um, that to do all of that. It would, <laughs> the ver verifying those numbers would be much more complicated than just taking the highest elevation within the building envelope okay. and running it from that point. Okay. Good point. So. So at 25, our original code, as it stands today, 25 allows you to build a two-story building? One story, excluding One. the basement, 25 feet. So you actually couldn't build a second story. Okay. So, that's, so, if, so the one-story restriction has been removed with this. The excluding the basement has been removed with this and adding just the height. Okay, so if we take Todd's suggestion and work top down versus bottom up, 32 feet, 35 feet, what gives you whatever? I mean, two stories. I mean, do you, I mean, what's consequential between 25 and 32? Because 32 seems to be a little bit of a number that he proposed as opposed to if we're going to go a different way with our math, I'm, I guess I'm just trying to understand how I we think, would set the standard. I think that if you measure from the highest point, then you could easily get the structure within 32 feet as Mr. Raines mentioned a minute ago, it's it's when you look below that highest point and you have that basement that his numbers start to get much taller. That that where the walkout basement's going to be at the lowest point, I think he was saying 41, 42 feet. But he said that with measuring from the highest point, he thinks he can speak somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 32 feet. Is that what you just said uh, a few minutes ago? Yeah, we can definitely hit that. And I, I don't know whether we need to add additional language, but I would want to make sure that that was before any any cut or, you know, removal of, of elevation that was done to the middle. Right. Yeah. Because we're going to, you know, as the slope comes in, we're going to backfill, obviously, to get the water away, and that's going to lower it even more at the front, so, because the grade's so severe. Um, it's just in the back sides of where the, where the fallout is, it's just, I mean, it is what it is. Even if I even if I left it as a crawl space home, I'm still going to be stuck to a 17, 18 foot tall home, and that's not going to not going to work. Yeah.
because the grade. Mid century is back in style here. Pardon me. Mid century ranch. ranch. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, um, all right. I'll board all and entertain a motion or some way to solve this challenge. I'll, I'll make a motion. Um, Make a motion to approve, approve uh, second reading of Ordinance 2018-008, Ordinance of the Board of Mayor and Aldermen of the Town of Thompson Station, Tennessee, to amend Section 3.3.7, Hillside and Steep Slope Standards within the LDO, uh, with the following modifications, that the height of the structure is 32 feet measured from the highest point of the existing grade to the highest point of the roof. And does that include, we want to incorporate Todd's suggestion? I said it added the word existing, existing. front grade. Okay. That Good. Todd, does that cover it? Okay. Got a motion. Second. Motion, second. 32 from the, from the, yep. from the highest grade. The highest point, yeah, highest grade. Motion, second. Second. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Raines. That hopefully got you where you need to be. Okay. All right. Um, let's move on to item number three under unfinished business. Uh, public hearing and second reading of Ordinance 2018-009, an ordinance of the Board of Mayor and Aldermen of the Town of Thompson Station, Tennessee, to zone 212.93 acres to the TC, known as the Transect Community Zone, located at 2816 Thompson Station Road East, Tax map 154, parcel 050.00 can be found in file zone amend 2018-002. Andy? Okay, this is second reading for this ordinance. Um, again, this is about 212.93 acres located along Thompson Station Road, also with frontage on Lewisburg Pike. The applicant is proposing a transect community zoning it's currently in the G1 growth sector, uh, which we discussed last, last month. Current zoning is D1. Uh, the Board of Mayor and Aldermen did pass this on first reading and requested that the applicant submit a concept plan. Uh, they did do that. It is part of your packet. Uh, I think they wanted to stress that this is a very preliminary draft. Did I get that? Um, so they want to be sure that this is a work in progress uh, I have already met with them on a, on a first concept plan along with our contract uh, with placemakers since it is the transect zone. They've got some direction for it from us and, and they have a, a decent way to go before they actually are ready to submit this a formal concept plan, but it's before you this evening. Staff recommends that you open the public hearing this evening and is recommending adopt, the Planning Commission is recommending adoption of Ordinance 2018-009 to amend the zoning of this land from D1 to TC. All right. Thank you, Wendy. We'll go ahead and open the public hearing and second reading of Ordinance 2018-009. Uh, anyone wishing to speak, please come forward. Mr. Gillum. Willis Gillum, 2104 Lewisburg Pike. I have a couple of questions. If y'all will pull your little thing right here, shows your drip field. Is this drip field, and developer may have to answer this, can it be expanded to include the Lewisburg Pike area since we have recently learned that the city of Spring Hill plans on bringing a four-lane road through the middle of our farm, which would entail this being zoned commercial, which would add to the value of the land out through there very significantly. And does the town, if they do have the capacity to expand this, does the town plan on providing sewer in that direction? That may be something that y'all don't answer on this, but that's basically my question. Okay. I, I think it's a, it's a great question. It's a well-timed question, Mr. Gillum. This gets back to a discussion we're having as a community about how we sewer our growth whether we continue with regional approaches, uh, sharing, you know, the similar systems among neighbors and, and developments. Um, you know, we've had a policy that's really tried to discourage lots of disparate small systems. 
in the interest of, you have another question? One more time. Okay. Okay. All right, lay it on us. The plans for this was in the eight to 10 year range. Me and my wife figured we'd be so old by then, we wouldn't know what they were doing. <laughs> but we have been informed today that Spring Hill has a six year plan to have this finished. So. Uh, they, they're on the clock as it relates to the interchange. And Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. They have two years to do the environmental study. Right. Four years to complete the road, or they lose the money. Right. So. Yeah. yeah. That's that's I think a pretty accurate statement about their the sense of urgency from Spring Hill. So back to the the comment around how how do we sewer ourselves as we grow? Uh, we've actually convened a sewer committee, steering committee of citizens from across the community to look into this very issue uh, going forward. Um, it's, we're a hot community right now. A lot of people, a lot of interest, both commercially and residentially. Many of you here are in the development business, you know that. Um, and so something like a Pleasant Creek proposal, or two farms for that matter, it gets into this question of how do we share resources, try to limit infrastructure spend and partner up where we can in logical places. Gravity feed sewer to, to the the natural lower points in developments, and then as things like Pleasant Creek are considered, yours is yours is the right question, Mr. Gillum, which is, will this be available, or could there be easements for connectivity throughout the Lewisburg Pike Corridor? Same thing as it relates to our regional plant we have serving Tollgate Bridge, Mark Canterbury, uh, issues with downtown and how do we sewer it. Uh, we we want to stay as much as possible philosophically out of the sewer business from a maintenance standpoint, so where we can save money and share resources. That, I think, is a smart move, public-private uh, uh, working together. And so um, this, is, this is the question, really, for us, because ultimately, with quality sewer systems available now, the technology, almost this toilet-to-tap capability, not, not almost, it's being applied, where you, you have a closed containment approach to sewering and then get back to tap water quality, uh, we can develop all Thompson Station tomorrow if we wanted to. We could just run over this LDO and allow sewer everywhere because every development can bring its pocket system. And so this is one of the things the, the sewer steering committee is looking into is this approach. So I think this is a fair question. I think a school site uh, area, just like Two Farms is proposing, um, uh, other public utility space, uh, certainly as we look at higher density developments, I think these are, these are all valid questions. Uh, because it's it's expensive, as we all know, and we're obviously seeing that play out with the school system right now. Um, so thank you for the, the question. I'm sorry I got on a little bit of the monologue there, but it's it's an important question. All right, uh, anyone else wishing to speak? Please. Good evening, uh, Mark Hosback, 1810 Savannah Springs Drive. Um, I am in the Savannah Springs, uh, an officer in the HOA there. Uh, just an update, we met with the Pleasant Creek folks. Um, they came in and laid out the concept for us. Um, we did have a couple questions as we move forward. Um, uh, some uh, specifics that we, we really need to know when they get to the site planning, we get to the building phase of this. We, we we are very concerned with the, the buffers that are gonna to have to be around the Savannah Springs area and how close everything's gonna be built. I know there's regs for that, but we wanna know what that is and what that buffer is gonna contain. Um, they're using five acres of a Savannah Springs a lot for green space, which we, we've all met and agreed upon. Um, but we also have concerns as they get into the building phase, we would like to know if there's gonna be condos, rentals, yearly leases, what's gonna be there besides single family homes. So those are concerns that we will be coming to each of the meetings as we go forward on this as part of the HOA's concern. The, the item you were here last month about, that was the five acres that- It is, question. So lot you, six of Savannah Springs. Is that being resolved to your- It, ha it has been, uh, okay. they've, they've mentioned some things that they're going to give us either in writing or some sort of documentation, we've yet to see that, but I think they're working on that. Yeah. So, okay. that's it. I just have, just the concerns on what actually is gonna be built in there, because yeah. always seems the concept for now. Right, understood. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, anyone else wishing to speak? 
All right, there being none, we'll go ahead and close the, um, oh, the developers here. Yeah. half of the developer just sure. to the extent the board has follow-up questions in response to the last meeting we did provide the very preliminary draft concept plans because obviously there's a lot of technical studies that'll have to come if we get approved to transect zone but we we heard you on wanting to see commercial wanting to see what that would look like see some of those things and so just want to make sure we're able to answer whatever questions the board has on, on that front okay there so. are so as I understand that the, the, the plan here, the, the preliminary plan, uh, commercial is on Thompson Station Road as well as Lewisburg Pike, and that's, red, dark red. Yes, that's T5, and that is uh, under, under the uh, town's ordinance. That's high-density mixed-use buildings that can include retails and office space. Um, also, in the T4 zones, which you'll see... Uh, the, the ordinance does permit neighborhood commercial and service uses. So it's potential that there, you know, to the extent it made sense as it was being developed out, demand, mm -hmm. that, that and all that would be fleshed out in, in the formal concept plan and the preliminary plat and all that. But um, there's, the, there's the potential for some in those areas as well under the ordinance, deeper in the development. Um, as you know, I live pretty close to this, probably closer than anybody else on the board. Uh, the T5 zone on Thompson Station Road, it's yes, hard sir. up against the interstate, and then you got the wicked S-curve, so this is kind of sandwiched in between. Right. Do you really truly really see that as a commercial zone? I'm all for commercial because I right. love the aspect of sales tax revenue for the town. Sure. But is that is that truly a smart place, or are you just kind of cramming it in there because... It, well, I'll let, I mean, Greg Gamble and Jeff Rosiak are here as well. I'll let them speak to the design standpoint on that. Yeah. We, we heard the, you know, what the Board of Mayor and Alderman has said they wanted through the ordinance loud and clear that the desire yeah. was to have that on those more major roadways. Mm -hmm. Of right. course, some of that could be put, it's all a percentage mechanism and you can have zero to 15% T5. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was the one who put the sign out there <laughs> and I had my three-year-old with me, so I understand how busy that road yeah. is and how dangerous that is right. uh, from the, the way it's done now. Obviously, traffic studies and the like will all have to be done to make sure that that makes sense from an entrance standpoint. Um, but, Greg, you may, you may speak to that. I'm Greg Gamble, uh, land planner and landscape architect, uh, consultant working on Pleasant Creek. If you don't mind, flip back um, to the slide that kind of shows the bigger picture. So this is turned... Uh, sideways north is is that direction, <clears throat> but you can walk over there if you want. Yeah, if that's all right. Please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very official. Um, what we're talking about is the T five that's located here on on Thompson Station Road, um, as was stated by Josh. There may be some improvements that need to occur um, to make sure that we have alignments ready, but. Um, we could see this area here as potential uh, daycare, uh, local, uh, something that is really focused on neighborhood um, services. Uh, I don't expect it to be a gas station. I don't expect it to be retail shopping. Um, mm -hmm. We've shown uh, some examples of maybe how we could do um, coffee shop. Um, some, uh, if you look at the, the next renderings, we'll show you those in just a minute. Right here is the area in, Tom, in Spring Hill um, that was recently rezoned. Uh, this area here will include office buildings, commercial, multifamily, um, higher density residential. As this develops out with the interchange, we're seeing a potential that some more commercial could be supported there. Um, if you'll flip to the retail elevation, Yeah, you know, keep coming. Two more, I think. No, well, there we go, right here. We like this architectural character that's being expressed in this image. We like that the buildings are the street edge and that the parking is behind. What takes place in here, I'm not really sure yet. Time is going to kind of inform this piece of the plan, but we can certainly see this as something that really becomes local services, local needs, 
it, it's not a regional commercial area by any means. Okay. I hope that answers. The no, that, that helps. I'm just trying to visualize it because it's it is a it's going to be a challenging corridor per your comments about the Alexander property developing and then it really is all that. It's and, all going to have to work together and in convenience yeah. stores and retail strip centers stuff like that. Probably it's going to be really kind of a crazy thing to try to cram in there. So that's that's good to know. We that keep it directionally where you're lower going. scale, More local scale, but walkable. still have this yeah scale. Okay, that. That helps understand, and we're, we love the idea of the, the economics that's having commercial sales tax. We would love to have it come sooner than later, so yes. a lot of that's going to have to fall yep. into place. Yep. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you, Greg. Yep. Yes, Josh. Uh -huh. any, any other questions the board may have? We're glad to entertain those. Uh, could, could you address the residents' comments about uh, condos and apartments? Yeah, there's no intent to have apartments here. We've said that in our meetings. We've said that very clearly. Um, so that's that's not something that we want, and I think Greg, um, to the extent we need to, Greg can speak to that as well, because from the product type and what we're trying to, the buyers we're trying to attract, that's not going to be attractive to them. So that is, uh, it's not that's not something we want to do. Okay. So no, no apartment buildings, condo buildings, mixed use. Greg, you want to speak to that we issue? To speak yeah. To and if you want to flip back to the concept plan that we have, it's probably one or two slides back. There, right there. That's perfect right there. Either one. <laughs> um, this property can only support so much density. And it's really being driven by the sewer capacity of the land, the quantity of open space that we have to provide. If we do have condominium buildings, we're showing where those might be located here. I'll take the microphone back over. Here in this location, um, we're looking at these as uh, buildings that would be two or three stories in, in height, that would have elevators, that would really cater more to aging adults who really don't want to have the maintenance responsibilities of a single family house any longer. Um, we've heard uh, in the past uh, previous meetings in Thompson Station that uh, residents want the age in place opportunities uh, here in town. And so though those probably would not be age restricted, that's really who we have in mind. How many total? Eight buildings? It's a, it's a guess right now. Again, it has more to do with our sewer capacity and really the carrying capacity of the land. Um, would we like to have eight buildings? I think that would be great. Um, I, I don't know that it would be more than what we're showing here. Um, the likelihood of it being less is probably better than more. All right, so when, when I'm looking at a concept plan, I'm looking for the breakout. X number of single family homes, X number of condos, X number of townhomes. You, you don't have that? We will drill in on that. But without having the transect zone in place, um, we still have to do natural resources plan. We still have to do our environmental study. We still have to do our traffic analysis. We still have to do a lot of the soils reports that have to go along with our sewer plan. Um, we still need approval uh, of the sewer system. Um, so there are a lot of things that are still in place before we have our concept plan truly nailed down, but we're happy to bring it back to you at that time and show it to you and present it in front of the board mayor and alderman, if that makes sense. So, so the, how many units are you proposing in that plan right there? Approximately um, three, 375, 375, roughly. Okay. I would just echo um, what Greg said. I was making some notes based on Wendy's staff report earlier. And there really is so much more to be done here because tonight is not a concept plan approval. I understand the board wanted to see something. We were happy to put something together. But we still have to deal with the wastewater issues, transportation study, geotechnical, biology, archaeological, natural and cultural resources. All those are, you know, a lot of expensive endeavors we have to get into that will have to be vetted. And the reason this can change is we may find pockets of things that we anticipate are going to be fine, but then one of the studies says, no, you can't have anything there. And so that, that's why this is all very preliminary, very much likely to be reconfigured. And that's why at this point, uh, you know, we're required to show to the board that this is consistent with the board, with the town's general plan, which in the G1 growth sector, the, the, board, the board's already said, transect zoning is consistent there and that it won't have that, you know, 
extremely negative effect on the neighbors in the town. So the bottom line is we're going to, you know, all that will have to be vetted and we'll be back before you all many more times between the preliminary plat and the development agreement, the concept plan, all those things will have to be fully vetted. Sure. Yeah. There's some things though that are fixed that are not going to change. This land area here is the best land for the drip fields. This needs to remain an open space for the drip. We've, we know that today. This area here, we really want to have a single family detached homes. There's, this is probably some, some of the more rolling topography. And to try and go in and do anything of higher density in this area would require a significant amount of earthwork and grading that we're not interested in doing. This area here over along the interstate is the flatter area. And this is where we want the higher intensities of the condominiums, as we had talked about. There's been discussion of potentially townhomes, maybe in this area here, as a part of the main drive, um, as a part of the park. Right now, this is the plan that we would like to have move forward. Um, there are still a lot of questions, though, about the level, the layers of due diligence that your ordinance requires us to do that has not been completed yet. So that's why, as Josh stated, this is still preliminary. There are some elements that are fixed. <coughs> the intention here certainly is single family detached homes with, with the supporting multifamily components. It looks like about 125 single family homes. Is, is that, am I close? Out of the total 375 dwelling units, it looks like about 125. No, the, the attached was a sm much smaller portion, and I'm sorry I haven't added them all up right now tonight. Well, what do you think the single-family home number is? Um, Out of the 375? Yeah. I'll have it for you in a second. Out of 375? 375. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, as designed right now, each one of the condo buildings, buildings is designed with between 16 and 18 units apiece with garages on the main floor on the rear so that there would be garages that the residents could, could park in. Um, so 18 times 8. At the most would be 144 out of that 370. All right, so if you have 304 single-family homes and 144 condos... That's not right. Yeah, that, something's not no, right. No, that's there. not right. Because we've never exceeded 375 units total on the plan. Our, our preliminary analysis of our sewer capacity shows that we're not going to have over 380 homes. How we want to slice and dice that, um, but that's our, been our preliminary analysis. We have much more refinement that needs to go in that, into that to better understand the carrying capacity of this, of Pleasant Creek. So why is it you guys want to do the, the transect versus a, a traditional residential road? In the, well, we like the uh, amount of open space, the fact that we use that open space for amenities, that we're creating parks, that we're creating a place, that we have a mix of architectural types, that we have a mix of lot sizes, that we're able to introduce kind of a, a full breadth of community uh, in one location, in one place, and we really think this is the, the right place to do that. Well, you could, you could theoretically do that in a D2, D3. I guess why are you asking for the transect versus that? Be, just because of the, the variety of architectural types, lot sizes, square footage, the, the mix of housing that would be permitted within the transect zone versus uh, what would be permitted under the uh, um, D2 and D3 zones. Which would just be the high, high density road. It'd be the condo. Right. The, condo. the difference, uh, you want transect to build the condo buildings. That's my understanding. We think that this is certainly an appropriate location, an appropriate place to have that mix and integration of uh, within one community, within one neighborhood. And I guess we go back to the town. When you look through the, you know, all these goals that the town has set forth 
under the general plan, and is especially since we're in the G1 sector and we're close to those interchanges, this is where the town itself has said it wants transect communities and wants to further that. And so when you go through, and we can go through all the goals, we've laid them out in our submission materials, but really the, this property lines up with the town's stated goals and the transect zoning on that. So it, it, it depends. Well, I don't want to speak for the town, so I'll just speak for myself. Sure. The advantage of transect zoning to me is a good mix of commercial and residential, mm -hmm. not overwhelmingly residential with what is the minimum square feet of commercial you're going to commit to or, or will you make any commitment at all? Well, I think I think the problem, the types of questions that are being asked, and I understand it, and I understand you're going to want answers to all those questions before that we can proceed with actual development, but the types of questions are... The issue with it is we haven't done all the studies that we will endeavor that will give us the final answers. I mean, Greg can give you what the commercial that's shown on the T5 that we've seen so far is, but there's also potentials within T4 that we'll have to see how that plays out. And T5 is 0 to 15 percent is your uh, percentage that's possible. So, I mean, that can fluctuate, and I think we're going to have to see exactly what the rest of the studies show that we ha that the land will allow us to do because I do think it's possible we could have an increased commercial depending on what the st all these studies that still have to be done must show and then obviously all that will be brought before the board on these various other levels of approval so we certainly think that the interchange location what Spring Hill is proposing to do to the south higher intensities would certainly support commercial square footage. Here we're looking at functional between 20 to 25,000 square feet of commercial on the areas that are shown here in red. I think that that's something that could be supported as the, as the housing builder. All right. I think if you can commit the 20,000 square feet of commercial, then I, I guess just for myself, I think I could go ahead and support this plan. But you got to commit to the commercial. Otherwise, you should pick a residential sure. zone, yeah. not a transect zone. Right, right. Well, and the desire's there to do that. Yeah. yeah. Can we go back to consumer questions real quick? Sure. A couple of questions. Uh, a lot of green space, you fit your qualifications on the transect, not having green space that happens to be in your sewer drip field. Right. Whatever. Uh, treatment facility you're going to propose. Uh, as you, as preliminarily, and I know you haven't done soils, and if you looked at your maximum proposed density of 370-ish units and the commercial EDU equivalents and so forth for sewer, and how much of that green space gets used up to, in Mr. Gillum's question, sure. can we talk about an easement and yeah. have an availability yeah. so we could actually use some of those drip fields for some of the neighbors. Right. I mean, so that area right there is what we are contemplating for the drip right behind that commercial on Thompson Station. How many acres roughly is that? I think that's, you want to do that? 20 acres. Oh, wow. But the, the, out of the 20 acres, a lot of that is for the reserve area. So it's not you're not using that whole area for drip. So so we had to have, and then based on whatever the town tells us, and I think the working the engineer working with groups on that answer. Right. How much backup do we have to have? Yeah. Yeah. We have we have uh, three areas that are approved by the state. We have a total of 29 acres that's available. 29 acres there, but that's available. Yeah, and if you'll notice, oh, contiguous or is it spread out? There's uh, the long arm, the yeah. flag is all designated for for drip. Yeah, all that area has been mapped for drip. And then the area that backs up to Savannah Springs, north of where the lots are. Yeah. That whole green area is that is possible. That's yeah, possible. yeah. Approved drip there as well. Our next, our next goal is to look at the five acres that is on the Savannah Springs based on how much we have to have for backup. Yeah. That has not been approved by the state. 
But the sole consultant has uh, done a preliminary report and says there's, there's some good and some bad. So there were, that would be three areas that we're, we're contemplating. We had a total of 84 acres of open space. So what I'm hearing is there should be plenty of drip field for not only this development, potentially, but I end think up with additional I think part of that de de depends on how much reserve the town requires, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the more reserve, the less excess. So, you well, know, there's... Well, well, that, that's right. That's right. So, yeah. you know... If it's 100% uh, reserve, that's different than if it's 30%, which I know there are differing analyses on all that. Sure. So, and yeah. all that depending on the size of the system, Three, too. What, uh, about 220 is our buffer number? Two, 250, is, 250. Our, is, 250. Is, our, is our number for per and ADU. Uh, average flow at Colgate, uh, for instance, right. is 180. -ish. Right. Again, we want to yeah. make sure there's yeah. appropriate buffering in there. I mean, I, I will say the Savannah Springs lot. I don't. Th there's no contemplation to put drip there. I do want to say that out loud because that's all. This is over on this side, but looking at well, obviously they've got sewer on all those or their own sewer on those lots, so you know some of that will will perk and be okay because it's a building lot otherwise. But but the goal is not there. It's all over here, and then the rest of that has been tested, and you know we think will more than sufficiently meet any reserve that's required. So. I think the town's interest is if you look at Lewisburg Pike, the Thompson sure. Road, Road, connector roads that run the horse mains and say, you know, are there ways into a treatment plant that just happens to be over there next to the interstate and it happens to be on Pleasant Creek and you add modularly to it sure. and you can pick up yeah. things yeah. as they come along. I mean, Blackberry Estates is just around the corner. Right. And, so forth and, so forth. and I think, you know, we'd be happy to sit down and talk to the town about that kind of public-private partnership and sit, you know, and discuss that. Yeah. So. I'd be real interested to see if we can come up with easements. And back to my comments about sites for public use. Sure, yeah. Some things I'm intrigued And by. all that will play into this, you know, the greater analysis uh, if we have the ability to move forward. So, okay. Anything else? Just want to make sure all the questions are answered. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so did we close the public hearing or was that still public? I think technically it's still open. But. All right, still open. Anyone else wishing to speak? There being none, we'll close the public hearing and we'll move it back to the board for a motion. Make a motion to approve ordinance 2018-009 ordinance of the Board of Mayor and Alderman of Thompson Station, Tennessee, to zone 212.93 acres to the TC tra Transect Community Zone, located at 2816 Thompson Station Road East, tax map 154, parcel 050.00, file zone amend 2018-002. All right, I have a motion. Are you... Are we tagging on the 20,000 square feet minimum commercial commitment as a piece of this or not? I mean, my, that was not a part of the motion, if I, if I understand it. I, I do think if to do something like that as a specific condition of rezoning would probably require some further discussion and wording. Um, and I guess I want to have that with Wendy about, are we talking about just reserving a certain number of square footage or a percentage of the development as T5 or specifically over and above T5 for commercial use? I think, that, it, I think it was just what the, what the minimum commitment was, what I heard for me, if we want to do it. I'd like to do it, but it's 20,000 square. He said 20 to 25, so the lower number was 20, 20,000 square feet commercial minimum. With, for me, for me personally, if you're going to zone something transect, it must have commercial in it. That's the advantage of the trip. 
that's the trade-off. You get the high, you get the condos and the higher density and the townhomes, but you also get commercial. That's what makes a transect community good. No commercial in a transect community, it's not a, it's not a, it's not good. That's not small town feel rural character. You're now you're high density urban. Uh, that that's my point. So without without the commitment of commercial and with a very weak concept plan, it's no, it doesn't seem to be well thought out at all. We can't even break, I can't even break out the numbers. They're flying all over the place. But once we rezone it, it's done. Sure. This is the second hearing. It's done. It's transect. There's no getting it back. And if it goes into further down the road and then something comes up, oh, you know what? There isn't going to be any commercial. That would be very bad. And I consider it a mistake. Yeah, it, it's difficult, and of course, this is a transect rezone. The same issue applies when we make amendments to a particular zone, like the, or, or even rezone a piece of property, uh, or make a text amendments that affect, for example, like the NC zone, based upon a concept plan that's being submitted. We're, we're not, again, I've broken record a little bit, but we're not approving that plan and can't rely upon that plan. We have to rely upon the zoning that's in place and what can be developed within those regulations. Um, I guess my concern would be adding a condition of a particular square footage of commercial on top of a, on top of the transect zone. I don't know what the effect of that would be. I, I could see limiting it or requiring a certain percentage of T5 because that fits within the LDO. But even that, I, again, I'll defer to <laughs> Wendy and Joe about whether that makes sense. And again, that's, my concern is the, is the specific um, square footage requirement, but requiring some sort of percentage of T5 is something we can absolutely do. Just like the green so again, space So you can make sure that you have yeah. at least some sort of commercial component that's in there. But saying specifically you need 20,000 square feet of retail. I didn't say retail. A commercial. Yeah, he, he, yeah. There was That's no right. commitment to retail. T5 doesn't guarantee commercial. It does not. No. High density residential. It, it could, could be potentially be that. That's right. Instead of commercial. That's right. That would be bad. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess the motion's there. Yeah, we got a motion on the on the table. All right, so we got a motion. Uh, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry. I was just going to say I totally understand the concern, and what I what I want to just make clear is the development agreement is our charge. You have to come back before the board of mayor's approval. So if there are additional specifics like that that you ultimately want included, that I mean, again, that is that will be coming before the board uh, for approval. Yeah, that's the way I look at it. But, but but you'll agree that by right, once we once we rezone the transect, we can't make you do anything. You you would be entitled to certain. We have to do the development agreement to proceed then, which right, right, right. Have, you wouldn't be bound to a 20, 20,000 square foot commercial requirement. You'd be bound to the transect zone, which wouldn't require any commercial. We couldn't make additional. I think that's right, technically, although you're going to be uh, proceeding to the development agreement that you then have to approve. I mean, okay. that's the framework in which the town has set the, set the, uh, set it, so. Yeah. It'll be an exhaustive list of deal points that'll be memorialized in that development agreement. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So we have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. A motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. We got three and two nays. No. I, I voted no. Okay. What was the count? Both of you voted no, right? Three to two. Just to be clear. In the affirmative. Alderman Dilts. All right. You are no Let's move on to new business. Uh, first reading of Ordinance 2018-010, an ordinance of the Bayer, Board of Mayor and Aldermen of the Town of Thompson Station, Tennessee, 
To amend table 4.4, permitted uses, section 4.6, building placement standards, section 4.7, height restrictions, table 4.13, NC, lot standards, section 4.9.5, regulations specific to the NC zone, and section 4.12.2, parking standards within the land development ordinance, zone amendment 2018-001. Thank you. It's a mouthful. This is a, this is not staff initiated. <laughs> okay, this is a request from Regan Smith on behalf of Regent Development or Homes to revise our land development ordinance. Um, on January 23rd, the Planning Commission uh, had this on their agenda and deferred it, requesting a work session. On February 12th, the Planning Commission had a work session to discuss these amendments. On February 27th, they reviewed the amendments and deferred to another um, meeting that was scheduled actually by the development team, which was held on March 20th, as Mr. Simmons had mentioned earlier this evening. And then on March 27th, they took it under review again and is, is prepared to make a formal recommendation. Just in the interest of making sure that there's no nothing left out, I'm going to go by them just point by point. <laughs> Under Table 4.4, the applicant is requesting that condominium and live work unit along with townhome be included into the table under NC, which is neighborhood commercial, as permitted. Under Section 4.6, they are recommending a table correction, which is appropriate, and also recommending that setbacks may be adjusted up to 10% or as necessary to accommodate easements for utilities. Under height restrictions 4.71, it's a table correction. Under table 4.13, neighborhood lot, commercial lot standards, they're requesting under the diagram that it not only reflects street, but civic space for residential only. They are also recommending a change to lot coverage, which has been proposed under section 4.9.5, letter B, which is the NC standards. It's specific to that zoning district, and we'll be there in just a moment. They are also proposing lot width 50 to 200 for non-residential, lot width 20 foot minimum for residential, and then a correction of the table under building frontage. Section 4.9.5, here's where the bulk of the changes are proposed. They are uh, requesting that live, work, and townhome units have a five foot or a 20 foot alley loaded driveway. Any live, work, or townhome unit with a five foot alley loaded driveway will have a minimum of a one car garage and provide overflow parking at a rate of one and a half spaces per unit. In addition, any live work unit or townhome with a 20 foot alley loaded driveway is subject to the one car and garage and overflow at 0.5 spaces, which is actually currently in our code under parking standards for any multifamily uh, uh, development. They are also recommending condominiums do not require driveways or garage parking, but parking be provided at a rate of two spaces per unit. Parking for all residential uses may be provided on street, nearby surface, and a, or a combination of both. Under B, they are proposing lot coverage for non-residential be a 50% maximum for, uh, and for residential, 90%. The residential lots that exceed 50% coverage will be required to provide additional area equal to or greater than the balance of that 50% in the form of open space or civic space. The additional open space or civic space shall be contiguous to or within walking distance of a, of a quarter mile to the subject units. Under C, they're requesting live, work, townhome, condo locations um, uh, set, um, and what this is is, do we have one of the maps? Okay. Should have asked for that earlier. They're requesting that the location of these types of units Okay, it'll be in their presentation. Uh, they're requesting that these units be set back a minimum 
from the edge of the right-of-way on an arterial. They originally requested Columbia Pike, but the Planning Commission recommended that they identify it from the edge of a right-of-way on an arterial. And lastly, um, this was staff's recommendation, that civic space may not include a nature conservancy area, that it shall be defined a defined pedestrian area accessible to all residents. And then their last uh, request is under 4.12.2, on-site on-street parking may be counted toward required parking along the subject frontage. Uh, the Planning Commission is recommending these amendments to the Board of Mayor and Aldermen, and this is first reading this evening. Should it pass, we will set the public hearing for May 8th. Thank you. The applicant is here, the development team is here, and I believe they have a presentation. Uh, be, before we begin, I, I'd like to request that Alderman Bell recuse himself from this discussion and vote based on conflicts of interest between his employer, Gresham Smith Partners, and uh, Regent Homes. On what grounds, I'm sorry? So there's several conflicts of interest that exist between your, your employer and Regent Homes. What, what, what are they doing for Regent Homes? That's for you to disclose, not me. I'm not aware of anything. Okay. Well, this is simply first reading. So I think we press on. Let's hear from the uh, development team. I know this has been deliberated on, agonized over, lots of community input, lots of neighborhood meetings. I trust that what is being proposed is is in line with, I guess, the, the sum total of all those discussions. I think that there was a lot of discussion and a lot of um, thought that the Planning Commission put into this. Okay. Well, I know that they, they put in a lot of work, the Planning Commission has. So anyhow, if the developer would like to come forward and uh, uh, Mr. McGowan, just short and sweet, or just yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to thank the Planning Commission and all the staff for working with us, trying to work out the details. We really want to build, um, when we said all along, the intent of toll gate, which is a town center portion of the property. A lot of little details that we've had in here would allow us to do that, and uh, and I think that we're well on the way of doing that. We do have the commercial track approved. We are trying to get leases in that and get that thing moving on that and hope to be submitting plans pretty soon on those. Uh, but as far as the rest of the sites, we will come back before the Planning Commission with each and every building that we plan to build in there and each section that we build and then work with um, the city on those. So uh, I don't know if you have any questions about the particular amendments in there, but the bottom line, I think that uh, uh, if we can get this, we can move forward and, and get the town center under development. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Okay. I will um, entertain a motion for Ordinance 2018-010. I'll make a motion to uh, approve first reading of Ordinance 2008-010, an ordinance of the Board of Mayor and Alderman, the Town of Thompson Station, Tennessee, to amend Table 4.4, Permitted Uses, Section 4.6, Building Placement Standards, Section 4.7, Height Restrictions, Table 4.13, NC Lot Standards, Section 4.9.5, Regulations Specific to the NC Zone, and Section 4.12.2, Parking Standards within the LDO. All right, so I have a motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Uh, discussion. Okay. Discuss. All right, uh, first under... 4.9.5, um, second sentence is in red in our version. Um, any live work unit or town in units with a five foot alley loaded driveway shall have a minimum of a one car garage. Uh, Mr. McCown, <coughs> Mr. McGowan uh, um, assured me at the planning commission meeting that the product that he was planning with the five foot driveway would have a two car garage. Um, Mr. McGowan, do you have any objection to changing that to two car? Okay. And then secondly, I want to point out the lot coverage, 50%. They're asking for 90%. Uh, 
Um, other than that being a bad idea, I think town staff recommended against that. Is that correct? Uh, town staff did have a different opinion um, based on the fact that at 50% you still have yard sufficient yard area. I think one of the things that the development team had discussed with the Planning Commission and with staff, and, and I don't disagree with what they were saying, is that uh, by providing additional area for civic space that includes um, pedestrian access, that is how they were planning on offsetting what staff's original concerns were. And again, just to be clear, the neighborhood commercial district does not require any open space. So again, if they do exceed their lot coverage, you'd be building in some, some open space into the area. Um, and just to make sure my memory is correct, I think that was the only thing that town staff recommended against. I think we were giving some history on why these standards were in place. Um, I think that as far as our recommendation, it was making sure that you had all the information from the past and why those were put in place before you made recommendations to change them. Okay. Um, then the second thing on the, the lot coverage that I'd caution the board about, um, the additional open space or civic space shall be contiguous or within walking distance of a quarter of a mile of the subject units. Um, I would rather strike the quarter mile language. Um, leaving open space within a quarter mile is quite a bit of leeway. I believe they've already done the math and there's the extra open space that they're going to give us anyway. Um, and this is just a, a way to get around our lot coverage restrictions and and throw it in and get credit for that open space. So what are you you're, at, you're recommending that it just it would say shall be contiguous to the to subject, the subject units. units. Yep. Okay. I'm just trying to visualize that. I, I think I understand. So we want contiguous green space and open space and play space for kids and walking dogs and so forth. Is this open space like in the median for the sidewalk, or when we, what is, what are we? So by changing it from within walking distance, it means that surrounding the units, immediately surrounding the units, they'll have to provide that area, whatever that calculation ends up being, attached to those units. Yeah, the, the picture that Mr. McGowan showed us was townhomes with 90% lot coverage, yeah. and then kind of a median in the middle of a, of a parking area. And that would be the open space, right. um, but the lot coverage would be <clears throat> more. So essentially, you have the same amount of green space in that area. Um, my concern with the language that it could be a quarter mile away is, is not what we were shown. I mean, that's well. And again, just again, just just to be clear, it does have to qualify as civic space. So again, just green space in the median wouldn't qualify. Okay. So what? So what qualifies? Well, again, we have all those definitions within the LDO. It's a green, it's a square, square a plaza. plaza. So again, th okay. those are, that's why we wanted to make sure that language was included. And that's why we also wanted to make sure that it was within a proximity to those units. Because again, you don't want to create an area that's just, yeah. you know, well, a, a couple of feet of green space. Yeah. And, and So this says in the form of open space or civic space. And my, my concern is with open space, as we know in the, the rest of, of Colgate, they don't have apparently one lot of buildable open space. Left. Well, then I think that might be a better amendment is to say it has to be civic space. It has to be civic space, okay. And then maybe even eliminate, uh, just like we did earlier, uh, you take out the uh, the nature conservancy area and say, you know, again, if you're gonna if your lot coverage is gonna be higher than fifty percent, it's got to be a usable civic space. Okay. And then you can keep the potential walkable piece in there. And that, and that quarter mile is roughly, for the average person, about a five-minute walk. I'd, that's fair. I'd be okay if it was a quarter mile for the civic space. Civic space. Uh, and it has to be either contiguous or... Sorry. Uh, 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 all right. Yeah, we don't Sir. bring plans into you, but if you go back and look at the plan, we gave you a measuring of where the live works are going to be and some of the townhouses. The whole idea is to be able to provide adequate parking. And so you actually have parking behind those buildings. And so... The question is, where is the civic space that you would have? And so if you go back around, 
look at other areas, we do have civic spaces where we have green areas that will be provided. It will not be ad immediately adjacent to those units. Yeah. And so, so that typically, yeah. in a, uh, an urban type situation, right. you create what we call pocket parks. Yeah. And so the pocket parks and the civic space will be within a certain walking distance. Yeah. And that's well, the main that's reason. Again, it's addressed to parking. So if you didn't have parking back there, you would probably have an area to do it. But the whole idea is to provide that parking. That's fine. I, I just don't want it to be swamp land on a ravine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, okay, all right. Um, then the third comment I have is we've pretty much, you know, Alderman Shepard and I have, have well documented our, our opposition to this, um, but I haven't heard the other members of the board really articulate the reasons they're in favor of this. And before we vote for this, I, I'd like to hear those reasons. All right, so we have a motion and a second. And uh, do we so let's take care of that? Do we amend the second or the? Uh, do we have a, what, what, what was the? Yeah, what let's was back the, what we've done so far? So the two. We have yes, a we would need to amend that motion to include. Right. If, if that's what um, you would want to have happen. I mean, the motion could be withdrawn, and, or it could be amended and. Uh, I, I did Brandon, did you make the motion originally? I did, yeah. What what was the amended language under it was under four point nine point five B? It was, it was the, letter A and it was for the five foot alley loaded driveway. The minimum garage would be a two car garage. And then the second change is the removal of the words open space under letter B, the additional civic space. Oh, actually, it should be removed in both sentences, the one prior where it says in the form of open space or civic space, and then the additional civic space. So there's actually three changes. All right, hang on. Is that correct? Yeah, and <laughs> we're striking the contiguous component. Right? No, we'll leave that in. No, no, well, let's, let's you should that. just get rid of contiguous because it'll be within a quarter mile. Yeah, it's contiguous. I think what right. we agreed is that we want usable civic and open space. Shall be, shall be within a walking distance of a quarter mile. Is that what it's okay. missing? Strike be contiguous or to or within a. Let me take a, let me take a stab at this. Um, I'll add to my motion the um, modifications under section 4.9.5 that uh, changes the language. Any live work or townhome town home unit with a five foot alley loaded driveway shall have a minimum of a two car garage in lieu of one car. And then under section B, strike the text B, I'm sorry, strike contiguous to or. So it'll read the additional open space or civic space shall be within a walking distance of quarter mile of the subject unit. Should be just civic space. I'm sorry, just civic space. So the sentence will read, the additional civic space shall be within a walking distance of one quarter mile of the subject unit. Okay, so Alderman Bell has made an amended motion that accomplishes what we just talked about. Yes, yes. second. So uh, Mr. Stover, second. Then you've Spoken, Graham, anything? I have a lot. All right. So, let's I just want to start with some questions for Todd. <clears throat> so Alderman Bell made the comment, I don't think you were there, but he made the comment that he voted to rezone the front of Tollgate neighborhood commercial when we did the LDO as a means to put the brakes on development until the town could get the right part. In your opinion, is that a valid reason to rezone somebody's property and prevent the property owner from selling that land to put the brakes on development until the town gets the right partner? Are, are you talking about when the LDO was adopted? No. When, see, I, I don't. I, I, I'm not. This, I, yeah, I don't this is what he said at the last <laughs> meeting at the town hall. You again, you weren't in attendance. Yeah. What what, what I'll say again mm -hmm. is that this is a text amendment to the LDO. Mm -hmm. So we are making changes to the neighborhood commercial zone. 
not for the plan that's been submitted, not for this developer, not even for the current still owner developer, but uh, that, that it should be based upon consistency with the general plan um, and whether these changes are in the best interest of the town. All right. There's legal Second. language that's, that is set forth in the ordinance for any text amendment. All right, Alderman Bell also said he would only support these zoning amendments if Regent Homes did everything. It could only be Regent Homes, and they had to do everything, commercial and residential. That's the, that's the, that's the only reason he would support these amendments. Is it valid to make zoning decisions like this based solely on who the builder is? Why don't you address that, well, Alderman Bell? Yeah, what's Give your question? Of that respect. I've got an issue with Bell. Mr. Bell, please... Yeah, well, what, what's your well, question to me, Grant? It's a legal, legal question. It's more of a legal Le question. I mean, what, what you said is what you said. I just want to know the legal interpretation of it. I, I think it speaks for itself. I don't know that there's... Uh, I would have to restate what I just said as far as what the standards are for a text amendment. All right. Let, let and, me. and again, we don't know that Regent Homes is going to be ultimately the developer this any more than Carbine was the original developer. All right, let me ask you this one. Have you had any discussions with anybody regarding this request and the settlement of the takings lawsuit filed by the Tollgate developer against the town? Yes. You have. Do you, do you expect this developer to drop the takings lawsuit if this board approves this rezoning request? We, during I don't know exactly when it came up, but during this process, we reached an agreement with counsel for MBSC to stay discovery until uh, this zoning process was achieved. And they have represented that if this passes, they will dismiss their takings lawsuit with prejudice. We have not brought that to the board because we want the zoning changes to stand on their own merit or fault. Have you told anyone on the board that information? I don't recall. I've told Joe that information. Did you tell anyone on the board that information? Not that I know of. I don't believe so. Okay. All right. I, I do have a couple of questions for Mr. McGowan. So this, so, so this is going to be a separate HOA for this residential piece. It's going to be its own HOA. Is that correct? And basically, in these type of communities, typically what happens, whether it's West Haven, Berry Farms, you have a master association that we fall under, and under that association is what's called a sub-association. Mm -hmm. In this community, in the section that we have here, there will probably be two or three subs underneath that. And so there would be required a sub-association on the, kind of the terms that we would talk to uh, the developer about creating. Okay, and they all roll up to the master? Yes, sir, they do. Okay. And in, in all three of these, two or three, I imagine it's one for the condos, one for the townhomes, one for the commercial, one for the commercial something right. like that. All three of those, they will not be required to pay any HOA fees to maintain the amenities that are currently in Tollgate. As far as the, any fees going back to the master, there typically will be some fees going back to the master. Uh, those fees usually will be for detention facilities that would be maintained by the masters or other facilities that they share in. And so basically, we sit down with the developer and we look at it and we do a calculation. And so let's say some of the water, the water we know right now is not going to the detention pond. It's going to a different area, but some of that area might be maintained by the association. So usually these subs association will contribute a dollar amount back to whatever association it should be paid for. So let's say the, the fountains out front, uh, they're enjoying those fountains out front. So somewhere along the line, there should be some money paid to maintain that fountain out front, either from the commercial sub or the townhome sub or the condo sub. All right. And 
even though they're sub empath I, I imagine all of them will be forced to use crystal clear, right? Say it one more time. All of these residents are going to be, and businesses, every single one will be forced to use crystal clear technologies for their internet. We have talked to them about that, and they've explained to us that's through DISH uh, service, and, and it, it is a requirement uh, that it will go through the current provider of uh, cable s source in there. We have had discussions with them, and we were told that it is a requirement that we go through the current provider. Okay. Uh, all right. So I, I just have some que just quick questions. When did you first meet Alderman Bell? Oh, I couldn't tell you exactly, but um, um, I've actually, I think, ran into him at a ULI meeting down in Nashville. I think it was an occasion probably a couple of years ago. Uh, to let you know, we've actually actively pursued this property for over five years. Uh, we actually looked at buying it before it was actually purchased uh, in a repo, repo situation. And uh, we've made uh, numerous offers in the past, uh, over three or four years ago, to the developer on this property. Uh, so um, we've had an interest in it. We specialize in T and D type developments, and uh, we have a, a team that has expertise in it. So um, we actually um, were rejected by the, the developer at the time. Um, ran in Bell, I think, at the uh, ULI uh, deal, said, "Are you still interested in that property?" I said, "Oh yeah, we made an offer about a year ago," mm -hmm. and uh, he said, "Well, you ought to." Uh, go back and look at it. Uh, I think they might be willing to sit down and talk to you. We got in touch with the uh, developer and asked him what their intent was, and uh, we prevented a, a letter of intent uh, of our interest, what we were interested in doing out here. How well do you know Alderman Bell's boss at Gresham Smith and Partners? Look, this isn't an inquisition, yeah. okay? Yeah. Let's stay on topic here. I, I'm on topic. Yeah. Well, I'll, be honest, it, yeah. I'm I'll be honest with you. We don't do any business right now with Gresham Smith whatsoever, and I do not know him at all. You don't know him at all? I don't know him personally at all. Okay. Uh, do you have in-house architects? We do not have in-house architects. Who do you use? We use numerous architects. Uh, we use Mike Hathaway uh, with the studio design in Franklin. We use Miss G and Associates. We've used Crossroads uh, Architect. We've used numerous architects in town and numerous engineers. We have over five different uh, engineers that work for us right now doing site plans and stuff. We do about 400 units a year just in the Tennessee area. In Alabama, we're doing probably this year 50 to 100. So. Um, we, we do spread that work around. Okay. That, that's all my questions well, for you. Thank you. Again, our intent is really to try to live to the intent of Toll Gates Master Plan. And I know everybody has a view of what that intent is, but I do think that uh, uh, when we get out there and get the product going, hopefully you all will be real pleased with, with the product and the end results. And these type of communities are very hard to work in. And uh, this process is very hard, and we've put our effort in to try to get to where we are now, and uh, hopefully we get there and get under construction this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGowan. I appreciate you investing the time and effort to get to know the, neighbor, the neighborhood and to work with the master developer on a solution. So thank you again for being here tonight. Okay. All right. Okay, I, I just want to make a couple, couple more statements. So the first one is, I agree with Ben that there is some, at least the appearance of conflict of interest here, and, I, and it helps me understand how this vote is going and why it's going the way it is. I do see how Alderman Bell can benefit personally and professionally by this rezoning and this work uh, and benefit himself. You've, I don't you've demonstrated absolutely no substance to that claim tonight at all. I'm sorry. Okay. So I will refute all of your points tonight. I understand, but I can see it. And uh, I also can see, I can see why even Mayor Napier would vote for this one because you take land that is commercial where potentially some more restaurants could go, which might take away business from his restaurant. I can see that, so I can understand why he might benefit personally and be for this. Uh, what I don't understand is how Alderman Stover can be for this, especially when he 
he said, he gave, actually gave me his word that he would not vote to rezone the front of Tollgate prior to the campaign. <coughs> went around, went around with Alderman Bilks all over the all over campaigning, and the against this type of townhomes in the front in Tollgate, and the people in the last election, and contrary to what Larry Simmons said, most people do not support the residential in the front. Most people do support the commercial that is coming. Again, we don't know when that's actually gonna come, but most people don't support the residential in the front, and I, I believe we'll show that again shortly. But with that said, I don't understand why Alderman Stover would be for this. And so to the question Alderman Dilks asked, what are the reasons really for this? I can list off about a dozen reasons of how Graham, this is it's real happen. simple. The mm -hmm. residents of Tollgate Village mm -hmm. have spoken. The majority of them have spoken and said they are in favor of this. This is what you've been preaching for months that we should listen to what the residents say. They've spoken. This is what they want. Right. Then, then let's what? move on. All let's right. move on. So A okay, this is uh, not benefiting you personally. The person who owns the most expensive home in Tollgate Village. I don't have the okay? most expensive you, home this in Tollgate Village. This is your Village. this is a personal agenda that you have. This I don't have any. Let's agenda. move on. Let's yep. vote. We've got to go. Yep. All right. Let's go. So you you just said Graham. No. Graham. No. Again, I, I know it's your tactic you to cut off when you need to you need to wrap it up. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm trying to wrap it up. Then, then so, make your final point and let's go. Uh, this We're is just like a, the other meeting. We got a, 10 minutes. And we, got, we got a motion as and if, a second. As if there's a clock on this. Yeah. But okay, here, here's one last point. So Alderman Stover said he's for this because he thinks the residents of Tollgate have spoken. But this is, this is, a, this is hypocrisy and a clear example of it. Because when people, 530-some people came and said, the land deal, we want a public referendum, he didn't give a rat's ass about, about what the people <coughs> thought then. He just went ahead and did, voted for the land deal. Couldn't care less. Now he claims, oh, the, we need to do what the people, people want. If he really thought that. It was amazing uh, to me if, the amount of people in my neighborhood who signed that petition had no idea what they were signing. It was amazing to me that a resident of Canterbury who had no idea about my wife or myself was going around telling residents my wife was Mayor, Alder, Mayor Napier's personal CPA and I was the sales rep for Circuit. My wife had to go to her firm and speak to her boss. Her job entails a license, an active license to be a CPA. All right. I don't know where, no, you're going to let me All finish now. Right. I don't know where that resident heard that information. I don't have enough dealings with him to understand that. I hope I never find out who told him that. That was a true sign of disrespect. That right there made me not believe what that petition was all about. When I have residents telling me, I don't really understand what I signed. I thought we would have a voice. The, the idea of that petition was we were not in favor of the bond referendum being issued. They had no idea what they were signing. They were just told sign this. That's it. That's All right. it. So let's go. We're, we're, we've drifted off a topic. I've, everybody's had a chance to speak. <laughs> okay. Yes. I wasn't finished, but if you're cutting me off, you can cut me off, I guess. Well, I, we're not covering any new ground, and I think it's devolving into well, conversations just, that are Just for the record, I have, so. no, I have no idea what Alderman Stover was talking about there, about somebody... Right saying right. something about his wife. I have no clue what that is. Enough. We don't have a lot of clues about where you get these conspiracy theories either. So with that, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes three to two. All right. <clears throat> resolution 2018-009, resolution of the town of Thompson Station, Tennessee to approve a contract with Bards Design Solutions, Inc., for engineering and consulting services for the wastewater system master plan and to authorize the mayor to sign the contract. Thank you, Mayor. Again, one of the, uh, uh, one of the conditions placed on that land uh, acquisition purchase that we did uh, a few months back was to make sure that we did go through the master planning process for uh, our regional wastewater system. Uh, 
Bars Design is a, already has a relationship with the town. They help us out with uh, um, uh, traffic study review and also are actually doing the plans for Kreitz Land right now and the Tom Station Road, Clayton Arnold intersection. Uh, so again, we reached out to them and had several conversations regarding a potential scope of work and um, uh, estimated cost of what this design would be. But again, uh, Paula Harris and Matthew Johnson are here in the audience today to go through the, uh, the scope of work briefly, because I think in your package you might have been missing um, every other page. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> so if I could, just to have uh, uh, Matthew real quick, just, just burn, through the, uh, burn through the scope of work. Thank you, Joe. Um, like Joe mentioned, I'll just briefly uh, go through the scope, just kind of hit the high points. Don't want to read this word for word verbatim, but um, if you need, feel free to interrupt me as I'm going through it. Uh, as mentioned, this is a scope to develop a sewer master plan for the town and the steps involved to get us to that point. There's also a couple of other items there at the end, I'll, I'll just mention as we're going through. So the uh, uh, second page there, um, phase one. First thing, in order to uh, get to a sewer master plan, we're going to develop a simple sewer system model uh, to evaluate both the capacity and condition of the current system and then eventually uh, look at the future conditions to uh, assess what improvements need to be done to the system in order to accommodate future growth. So the first task would be to just uh, collect the available information on the system, both on the collection system and the wastewater treatment facilities, <clears throat> including the, um, the wastewater treatment reports that are monthly uh, done and sent to the state. Um, we'll also visit both the pump station facilities and the wastewater treatment facilities to assess both the condition and make any recommendations on any necessary improvements. Uh, looking at the pump stations, it's my understanding that some of them may be a little bit out of date with the town's current standards. So we'll identify those deficiencies as well. Um, once we've collected all the relevant data, the next step will be to develop the model, next, the second task. Uh, and like I said, it, this, is a, this will be a fairly simple hydraulic model of the system. Uh, we'll essentially use the uh, available GIS data. Um, we'll try to fill any data gaps with uh, available record drawings, um, and we'll also incorporate the information we get on the pump stations uh, into the hydraulic model, uh, force main alignments, and moving on to the third page. Thank you. Um, we'll uh, look at the dry weather flows uh, in the system and assess what the current condition is of the system as far as capacity goes and where there might be some existing um, issues. Don't anticipate any, but uh, that is something we will look at. Um, once we've got a good current day model, uh, we'll sit down with the city staff and go through what the expectations are as far as the eventual master plan. Um, we'll uh, discuss any areas that were there's anticipated growth development, some areas where there's already some dedicated to be, to be developed. Um, we'll look at population projections for the, uh, for the town and set, uh, identify what the, those planning phases need to be. What, how far out do we need to look? 30 years, 10 years, 20 years, that sort of thing. Um, once we've identified all those items, we'll go back we will run the model based on the information given to us and that we develop uh, for the future development and where the, the town will be during those identified planning stages. Um, we will look at, once we've developed those, uh, uh, those stages, 
we'll identify where in the wastewater system we've got deficiencies, uh, specifically related to capa capacity. Um, we'll develop some alternatives to address those deficiencies. And then, again, sit back down with the city staff to go through those alternatives and narrow it down to what alternatives are reasonable and feasible and economical uh, for the town. And then further develop those once we've kind of narrowed it down. Um, flipping to the next page. Um, once we've done that, we'll have a workshop to go through those alternatives. And once we've come into some sort of agreement with the uh, city staff, those alternatives that we've identified as the most feasible, uh, those will go into the eventual sewer master plan, that being uh, task four, which will be a report that we will include all those items that are necessary to uh, provide the sufficient capacity at those planning stages um, that we I mentioned earlier. So we'll have a final workshop and we will uh, eventually wrap up the report. I'll point out the current um, time frame is to have this draft master plan developed in five months. Then we'll have the final workshop and uh, finalization of the report one month later. Um, task five is related to the master plan, but uh, somewhat outside of that portion of the scope. Uh, this was a task that was included to so that we would go evaluate the current drip field uh, locations, treatment facilities, and uh, provide some recommendations on how best to feed those locations and distribute the flow between those sites. Um, what will come out of this will be a technical memorandum with the different alternatives on how to uh, approach that, uh, both from a uh, operational standpoint and an economical standpoint, and then make a recommendation on what we believe is the best suited for the town. Uh, task six is simply to provide any support that's needed at any public meetings the town decides to have to discuss the uh, results of the sewer master plan. Uh, and we can provide any visual aids, uh, maps of the wastewater system, that sort of thing. And then uh, last page, task seven, this project admin, that's exactly what it says it is, just general project admin, project management um, task. <laughs> Uh, you'll notice phase two, this, these are a couple of items that have been discussed but are not included in this scope for approval this evening. Uh, but there's a couple of items that we had discussed prior. These, these couple of tasks are rela related to what's in phase one. Phase one essentially needs to be completed before we can do these last couple of tasks. And very simply, they are a utility rate study on the wastewater side of things and then Last page, a cost segregation analysis, which would evaluate the existing assets in the wastewater system. So again, those two are not included in this, uh, this, this work. Um, that's pretty much it. I, I, again, I was trying to be brief. Are there any uh, questions on what's included in here? Again, I will point out, the, again, the cost of this study was uh, proposed at $93,000. That's what the contract is for. Uh, I'll point out that within our budget, uh, current fiscal year budget, we have $30,000 set aside for consulting engineering. Obviously, this project will bridge fiscal year, so we'll just make up the balance in next year's uh, budget. So again, there's no budget revision or anything necessary for this. We'll, we'll just cover it in our, our current operating. Okay. All right. Okay. Questions for the barge team? Joe, did we, the utility rate study, did we think that that, I remember we had some discussion, I think it was maybe from Ben or Graham about having a different entity do that, or was that? Again, we, we were looking at it, it was part of one of the original conversations we had with Barge when we were first contemplating what the scope of work would look like, but we did decide to, to kick it until a future potential phase if we decided it was necessary after we get through the, uh, the original study. So again, that's, that's the only reason it's mentioned in there. Again, it's not included in their, in their uh, the cost for this scope of work. 
again, it's a, if, if we get the, to the end of this, uh, this particular study and we feel it's still necessary, then they could roll right into it. But again, that would have to be a separate agreement uh, and come back to this board for you know, another, another approval. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, well, back to the board. Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the resolution 2018-009 as stated by staff in our agenda. Uh, before we have a motion, I have at least one question for Joe. Um, the $93,000 cost, and then we have a time of completion within six months. Six months. Um, I noticed, and I'm trying to learn from our mistakes on Price Lane, is there any penalty for not complying with that? Um, I'm sure we can add something. There is not in the contract. There's not in there now, but uh, I'm, I'm, well, I guess. Can, can we add a penalty? What, what is a reasonable? Yeah, I, I guess I don't really know what the reasonable penalty would be. Because again, this is engineering, not, not um, it's not an actual physical construction project. Right, right. But so I don't know if you could withhold retain in this, insurance. In this case, it's in the town's strategic interest to get this moved. We have basically have as quickly as possible. On sewer taps until this is done. Yeah. If this is not done in six months, that's a major problem for the town economically and and uh, potentially for the future group. Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't know exactly what kind of penalty we could word in there. Um, I mean, it's an engineering other than, other study. Than, there's other a than with delivery date. What what would put us behind? I mean, I'm just there. It's, we it's could, all professional uh, service. Yeah, control. we we could ask for a draft at a specific point to keep, make sure they're staying on task. And I mean, we can always terminate the contract. So if they're not, you know, delivering yeah. a draft, then we've wasted six months. We're back to square well, no, one. And we don't, I wouldn't say it takes six months to get a draft. That'd be when the final drafts do. So you know, if it's if it's you know three and a half four months or uh, that's just I'm just throwing guys. I'm just throwing something out there. Even so, well, if if they have if they have no issues with completing it in six months, I wouldn't think they'd have issues with any financial penalties for for non-compliance with that deadline. If you know, with the, with the caveat that circumstances beyond their control would not be they would not be held to. But oh, do you have any thoughts, Ms. Ferry? Given that this is a professional services contract, there are a lot of things that, you know, we would have to be meeting deadlines on. Uh, getting information from staff, timing of stakeholder meetings, there are a lot of variables. I mean, uh, we do have it built in that we will complete within six months. Um, we anticipate having at least monthly meetings, check-in meetings with you all, with staff, to make sure that we are on task and that we're staying according to scope, moving it forward in the best interest. Especially, you know, as you're putting together this committee mm -hmm. um, and how we work with that committee, too, as you all require us to or need us mm -hmm. to. Uh, but it is unusual for a professional services contract to have a, a penalty. Oh, okay. That would be something that, like I said, there's so many things going back and forth, working with staff, working with You're the board. You're on the YLS and Cables. Sure, yeah. Galvanized workshop. So. Mm -hmm. But we will definitely be staying, staying in contact. If you want us to come back in front of this board, um, two, three months, give you a status report, we'll be more than glad to. And just and tell I, us when you would need to do that. And I think a recommendation that I might make is just simply say, you know, maybe every <coughs> two months we just have have uh, a representative of ours come back and just make sure that or provide a report right. that can be included in the packets to make sure we they're staying on task. Part of the agenda. Sure. Uh, yeah. We can, uh, well, and again, every other month, because again, at the end of it, it would be the final project right. or the final presentation. So. Because as, as Matthew said, you know, in five months, that's when we're looking at having the draft report to you, and then getting comments, and then that final month to complete that. Right. Sounds like a fair enough approach. Okay. Thank you. Typically, with construction, you can you can do like a retainage percentage that you know is withheld. Or for service, it's usually you just terminate the contract, send them on their way. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I get that, but in this case, terminating the contract probably doesn't help. Us more yeah. than that. Just have an early intervention meeting. <laughs> well, we tried. We tried that on Christ. It didn't work out too well. All right. Any Make other a motion to approve yep. resolution two thousand eighteen zero zero nine. 
the resolution of the town of Thompson Station, Tennessee to approve a contract with Large Design Solutions, Inc. and Engineering and Consulting Services for the Wastewater System Master Plan to authorize the mayor to sign the contract. I have a motion. Second. Second. Motion second. Just one quick question before we vote. So last month, you, you, the mayor announced the formation of a sewer committee. I'm curious to know what the deliverables of that committee are different from what we're paying for. It's unclear to me what why that sewer committee exists and what we should expect from them or what you expect from them. Yeah. I love hearing from the people that live here. We have a lot of professionals, including some that are still with us at 9 o'clock, 9, 10 at night. Uh, thank you, Mr. Risden, uh, for being here. Uh, they're setting their agenda uh, as a team, and they are setting some priorities based on what they've learned in their first meeting. Mm -hmm. So the first meeting was a landscape meeting this past week, right? It was. It was. It was on Wednesday. Yeah. So uh, the beauty of it was is that a lot of folks got informed. They learned uh, the complexities and the subtleties and many things that are going into not only the, the actual physical plant and drip field, proposition, but really the, the strategy that we need to deploy, like I already spoke to earlier. So I look at the Citizen Steering Committee as an advisory group that works with the professional engineers to help tee up what it is going to be, um, you know, a, a number of big uh, inflection point decisions for our town. Do we centralize? Do we decentralize? Um, what systems are allowable? Which ones are not allowable? How do we approach the rate structure long term? You know, as a person that's paying the sewer bill. How do they feel about it? How should we be setting equitable rate structures and so forth? So I really look at the the, the citizen steering committee as, as being an adjunct, uh, actually really an uber governing steering kind of group that advise our, this board on some direction issues that we'll vote on. And then the professional engineering team can, can, can help with the, the nuts and bolts of the analysis, so. When, and again, just as a report on the first meeting, we really just discussed, well, besides introducing all the board members to each other, was just discussing general operations of the existing plants, and then our next meeting is scheduled for May 2nd, and the only thing currently on that agenda is just touring the plants, just so they can get a, a, a physical, you know, uh, view of what it exactly would be. But That's all so far. It sounded like rate structure was the key difference. With the I mean, it could Sewer be something we, will be we talk about. Structure, but barge will not. Barge right now is not, that's not part of their scope is to okay. look at this rate structure. So that's, that's something. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. So I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Great. Thank you, Barge Design. All right, let's keep moving. Forward. Uh, dedication request the fields of Canterbury phases one, six, and nine. Thank you, Mayor. Again, these are just uh, some completed phases there within Canterbury. Um, again, if the town does assume uh, or accept dedication, we'll be assuming responsibility for all the public infrastructure. These include storm drains, roadways, alleys, sidewalks, wastewater facilities, etc. Uh, again, they have been evaluated by uh, by the town. Again, we're recommending uh, phase one. For road drainage and wastewater combined, a, a total maintenance bond of $115,000. Uh, phase six, total maintenance bond of $65,000. And phase nine, uh, $133,000. Again, the, these, uh, these amounts will be held in, in place for one year, ensuring that everything is operating the way it's supposed to operate. Uh, and then we'll either uh, fall off or we'll be extended in case the additional repairs uh, would be necessary. And I did go back and look at some of these plats just to make sure that, because again, I know in Bridgemore and Tollgate both, there's uh, issues with uh, private technology easements. Phases one and six in Canterbury, there are technology easements noted on those plats, but again, they are not considered private. And then I believe in phase nine, there, there weren't technology easements listed at all. Again, didn't want that to be uh, an issue. Um, so again, they are uh, ready for uh, acceptance of the Board of Mayor and Aldermen. So uh, staff is recommending that you approve the, the uh, Request for acceptance of roads, alleyways, sidewalks, storm drains, and wastewater facilities in phases one, six, and nine, and then set the maintenance surety amounts as recommended. Thank you, Joe. All right. We have guys on either side of me that live in Canterbury. I'll entertain a motion. 
a motion to approve the request for acceptance of roads, alley, sidewalks, storm drains, wastewater facilities in phases one, six, and nine of, of Canterbury. All right, I have a motion. Second. Motion second. Questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye, Aye so moved. Uh, we are not going to cover agenda item number seven, so we have announcements and agenda requests. We're table, tabling item seven until yeah, next we're week. we're tabling item seven. It's not, it's been scratched from the, yep. scratched from the agenda. Okay, all right. No announcements or agenda requests? Uh, I have some things. Well, you, you gave me the trip count trigger, some something. You sent me something. I looked at it briefly. Our estimates, yeah. All right, and I had follow-up questions, and okay. We can we can keep going back and forth on those. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. So last, getting stuff on the agenda. So I'd like to have something put on the agenda. Is this the time to make a motion and vote on? Is that how we're doing this? So agenda requests, yes. All right. All right, I'd like to make a motion that town staff put on the agenda for a vote next month that all annual staff compensation increases will occur simultaneously. Second. Okay, so not that this is strictly just getting everybody on the same calendar cycle for performance reviews and performance increases based on our budget year. Actually have raises take place at the start of the fiscal year rather than staying. Not, not based the on, July. Yeah, yeah, not based on Fair. when someone started working and then, because they're spread, my understanding is they're all spread out all over the place. And I, I think that's not based on their starting date. Based on start date, I think it should be the argument I'll make is it should be, it'd be better if they all were effective at the same time. Like most companies have. Why? Why do you, why? I don't know if I understand why. Why is that better than? Because it, it, it sets the groundwork for the following steps, which I'm, which will come later. But what I talked about last time was then we would set. The next step would be, and then we set a, we peg those increases to some kind of index. And again, we need to think, I need to think a lot more on that. And then after that, the BOMA actually votes on that. The town administrator decides who gets what, but we vote on the total amount of increased expense in the next year. And then Joe decides how to partition. But the first step is, where I'm going in the first step, what I'm asking tonight is, we just vote on changing that so that it all happens at the same time. That's the first step. And that's my motion. You do vote on a percentage now. Yeah, we, we, put, we put something in the budget, but again, I can't, it's hard to track. Okay, okay we'll have a first and second. First step, I'm not sure what he's calling it. Well, this is just put HR. this is this is just to put it on the agenda. We can talk about it and debate it and bat it around during the next meeting and think about it between now and then. This is just to put it on the agenda for discussion and a vote. Okay. So next motion, one. motion and second to put this request on the agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Right. Okay. And Again, so in, when I was in the Army, we had this thing called after action reports. And what you do is you look at what you did and you, what did you do well and what, what can you improve on. And that's something that we did standard in the Army. A lot of companies have like post-mortems on projects so we can figure out again what went right, what didn't go right on certain projects. And so I would like to make a motion, put on the agenda, no, actually, I would like to make a motion directing town staff to provide a post-mortem or an after-action report, whatever you want to call it, to the board next month on the Kreitz Lane realignment project, and they can tell us what went right, that we should continue when we widen Kreitz Lane, what went wrong that we can learn from when we 
go ahead and take the next step and widen Christ Lane. And because uh, I know for I know that we went over budget and I know we went way past the deadline. And uh, I'd like to prevent that the next time if we can learn from what we did on this small first realignment step in Christ Lane. So that's my motion. That's a good idea. I like that. I, yeah, I, I, I would think it's suggest can we do it a written report and then yeah. we can yeah. that'll be delivered yeah. next month and we can review it and if there's a time for discussion the following. Yeah. Or and next month is our. I mean, if you think you need two months or. I, sh I should be able to put something together okay. before our next meeting. All right. That's a great uh, idea. Why, why is we transition to the Kreitz project mm -hmm. and evaluate everything? So. Yeah, if we could, though, I'd rather have it as an agenda item so the, the public can see yeah. that discussion openly and clearly. So we're going to put it on the agenda for next month if we want a report as well? Or we can have a two months. What, 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 what way you want? Can, can you do the report and then Maybe present it to the public and the board next month, or do you need two months? Um, again, I could probably do a report uh, within 30 days. Uh, if you want a presentation and everything associated with it, yeah. why don't you give me till June? Let's, okay, let's, let's do June. Do it right, we'll give you two months. Two okay. months. Deal. Yeah. Okay. I just didn't want to get them combined. Try yeah. to, uh, yeah, nobody might not be wrapped up. Right. Right. And then I got some other. Oh, audience. no, we're going to be wrapped up with crates by then. <laughs> well, I mean, with, the, with everything. I mean, where we've gotten our reports from. That'll be, our, that'll be the 10th bullet point. Yeah. So, crates won't be ending for years. <laughs> all, the, all the work on it. Yeah. Uh, just, okay, so, do we need an official motion to vote on that? Uh, that sounded unanimous. If you've got a motion second. You, second. you did the first one for a vote, so you might as well vote on this okay, one today. Well, he made a motion second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. All right. Uh, this next one's not a vote, but I noticed in the town administrator report there's something about the TriStar facility twice daily. Oh, yeah. Why can't we get any wastewater taps? And uh, I'm 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 inclined to make an exception for commercial. Is it? Do we have to have a hard and fast? Nobody gets any taps. Period. I think or? we set a bad precedent if we do that. I mean, I, trust me, I. Love to have that thing there faster than anybody. Okay. It makes my morning commute a lot quicker, but I'm just afraid that we set a bad precedent by doing that. All right. I, it's up. I'm willing to debate that a little bit and open it for the, discussion. Even the previous, like when we purchased the drip land, we said there was no taps to be issued until the repairs are completed. So that we'd have to rescind all that. Well, we wouldn't have to rescind it. We could. Adjust it in that it's apply, the moratorium applies to residential development, and we're going to accept commercial development because of the economic interest. Yeah, that that sounds good to me. Again, we've been we've been explaining to folks that we're not. Again, they can come and make the uh, make the request to a, to the uh, to the board, but we've been telling everybody that you know, look, we have this motion that was made several months ago that no new taps were going to be issued. Um, again, if we want to stop doing that, that's fine. We can, we can have them just come and give the, give a presentation or make the request and you guys can decide. Yeah, I'm just, I'm throwing it on out a case there. by case basis. I'm just, so Graham, I'm, Graham, I think it's a, it's a yeah. fair request. I mean, I think we, we know generally where we want commercial and if we're creating the kind of commercial we want for our community and, and it's in a corridor where we, if it's in our primary sewer, regional sewer district. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's a it's a fair question. And yeah, uh, there's nuances about residential versus commercial. And we just had a discussion with Pleasant Creek about allowing them to have a residential system, right? Back to these earlier comments about, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, are we opening up sewer taps or are we not? But yet we'll go ahead and do a site specific kind of approval kind of thing. So no, I, I'm game for at least a discussion. I would hate to have it in the context of just twice daily. I mean, it's like, are we agreeing that we could open up the, you know, for I think this additional is, commercial, so. This might be a discussion for the next utility board, possibly have, and if you want to do that, we will. Well, and again, I think because it was, it was really an action by the board that's kind of directing staff on this, mm -hmm. I think what we might want to do is have an agenda item on the next agenda so that we can discuss whether or not we want to make yeah. an official policy uh, as we work through this wastewater study or if we want to allow some sort of um, 
know, flexibility for this board to, you know, approve commercial or, or, or however we want to. Motion to discuss how we discuss. A mo well, yeah, a motion to discuss how we're going to handle future wastewater taps uh, requests yeah. as this study is ongoing. Okay. I agree. Good idea. All right. Discussion to discuss. <laughs> The uh, wastewater pledge brought it up last month. The the letter. You said you were going to put something in front of us this month. We don't have it. I, I don't have a draft. I don't you know exactly what it needs to say other than I, so-and-so alderman of Thompson Station, don't want to put a wastewater plant at Canterbury. The, 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 your undersigned promise. Never. Never again, at, at any right. time, Sewer any member can make that, that comment. So again, it's I'm, I'm, if you if you make that motion now, I'll I'll have the letter that everybody can sign tomorrow. Well, it's a pledge. I think it's one document. Well, and again, it's a it's a pledge. It's 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 basically in the political realm. Whatever you guys want to do, I'm fine with doing it. So, <laughs> all right, I'll make a motion that you draft a pledge for presentation at the next meeting that states. I'm just saying, I don't even know if you need it presented at the next meeting. You can just ask that the pledge be taken right now. <laughs> well, I w I'd like something in writing, and I'd, I'd also like to get the pledge in, uh, verbally right now for people are ready. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, the written pledge should, should state that no one's no no waste, document. No will, wastewater will ever treatment plant. Vote to put a wastewater plant on the Alexander property. Okay. Second. Didn't... Uh, wasn't Bob going to come and talk about that today? Isn't that what he was? Yeah, you didn't. You didn't want to watch his video. Well, you, you didn't show up. Um, well, he had a work commitment. I understand, but you know, we have to. It's it's unfair to just let anybody shoot videos at the hearing. So well, I think we made the right decision on Not that. Just um, anybody. I think you know. I, I think, think any resident can shoot a video. You know, if he wants to come in next month and talk about it, we'll do that. Well, he doesn't need. He doesn't need to. We can pledge right now. I, I pledge publicly. I pledge again I'm, right now. I will never I, vote to put it. I have. I've never, in, in all the drip bill purchase, I never anticipated there being a, a sewage treatment plant on the, on the. Uh, well, there, there was a pretty, I, I, in fairness, I believe you weren't there, but there was a pretty lengthy discussion when we had a work session back in August about putting sewer plant on that property. Who, who said they were going to do that? Uh, no one said Joe, they were going to do no it. No one said they were going to do it. I mean, it, it seems like it's work. been. It's, it's been pulled out of thin air. I just don't, I can't, it, it, I can't it trace it back not, to, well, it who? Has not been, who said it, though? Joe, the mayor. Joe, so Joe Ryan. needs to sign the pledge, then. <laughs> Deal. Sign it. I will not put a wastewater it. plant. The mayor was on there, on the tape, going, so, and here's where the sewer plant would potentially go? Just, I don't, yeah. That, you know, that, there was a, a lengthy discussion. Okay. I wasn't there, so I, I never said it. I, there's no reason for me to say that I'm not going to do it, because so, I've never said that I am. Are you? No, I just said I'm not. So you're, you are ne you are going to pledge right now, here and now, you will never vote to put a sewer plant on the Alexander I, I have no intentions to put a sewer plant on that property. You will, that's, you will that's never, do, you that's will never I, do it. I, ben, that's what I said. I said that's, I have no well, intentions. See, you're, you're weaseling yeah, out. I'm, 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 I'm telling you, come on. You're right. saying I don't have a, and <laughs> I, <laughs> All right. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm really would like to get it to an adjournment. So. Well, right. well, so. I, I seconded the motion. So the motion is. Motion second. The pledge will be. favor. Aye. Brian, you are not willing um, to play? Listen, we have Mars to do a study. We have a utility right. board. I have no intentions no. of ever putting a wastewater system on there. Let me do a job. I'm not prepared to sign a document right now until we have a completed wastewater study done on that matter. Right. I have no intentions of ever putting a wastewater system over there. Right. Thank I can you. sign what the person who wants it to said that was, quote, unquote, a meaningless letter. What's the purpose of it? What it, is the purpose of a quote unquote meaningless it letter? Puts us it's 100% it political. It's it political. Is. It's very political for it both is. of you. It is because it's very political. Some, so some of us have a history of, of changing our mind and going back on our word. I don't go back on my word. You, you did on the front of Tolga. You just did tonight. Right. Have to say. You right. promised Order. me you All wouldn't right. rezone the front, and There's you no other, and you didn't keep your word. No other items. I'll entertain a motion, motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.